Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Alex Fest. Uh, and uh, I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, Jeff Holman. Uh, Jeff, uh, Michalis, and I go back a long way. Uh, Jeff was uh, a teacher uh, back at Princeton. Uh, he was our teacher in ways that go beyond the net, go beyond the world. Uh, he learned uh, really a lot from him. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, she was Michalis' advisor. My advisor was Ken Stiglitz. He worked today in Columbia. We were, we were quite by his time. So, uh, 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 and, uh, and, uh, 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 she pioneered a lot of the things that, uh, that uh, Michalis uh, and I continued and, and, uh, and uh, uh, many other things. Uh, uh, he was a uh, professor at Princeton, of course, uh, then he went on to be professor at Stanford, our colleague, our colleague at Stanford, both Michalis and mine. Uh, and uh, of course he was uh, awarded with our Columbia colleague, Aleko. Uh, he shared the two in award. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, for uh, this pioneering work on um, uh, the mathematics and theory and, and thinking underlying uh, 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 computers, okay? uh, in particular compilers, you know, but, but, but um, uh, uh, more generally, you know, back then, theoreticians were in charge of all of, all of them. Uh, and Jeff was leading the way. Okay, so uh, today he could tell us uh, how to multiply uh, uh, matrices without. Uh, okay, well, thank you very much, Christos. Uh, okay, so I, I uh, let's see, the clicker, yes, there is. Okay. Um, okay, so I, I was planning to start off by telling the story of how uh, Mahalis and I when at the time he was at, uh, at Bell Labs, uh, we almost won a best paper award for our work on transitive closure. But I understand this is being recorded and I don't want the story on YouTube. And, and, uh, uh, but if you're interested, yeah, I, 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 I think a number of you heard it last night, but um, uh, I, um, anyway, uh, you can talk to me about it if you really care. Um, Anyway, uh, what I want to talk to you about is, is another sort of thing that you might think has been worked over uh, to death, uh, which is a matrix multiplication. Uh, and I, I should emphasize, this is not my idea, but rather uh, the idea of a, a fellow by the name of Daniel Cusson, who at the time was um, an undergraduate at, at Stanford. Um, and... Uh, uh, Daniel, uh, you know, he's a, he's a funny sort of guy. He's the kind of guy who, uh, who likes to invent stuff more than he likes to, um, you know, attend classes and stuff. Um, but um, at any rate, again, I can tell you more about that. But uh, so I, I want to, first of all, explain why there might be something new to say about, uh, about matrix, matrix multiplication. Um, and... Uh, then I, I want, uh, well, uh, the objective is, of course, not to use a, a, mul a multiplier circuit. Now, the fact is that it has been known, uh, according to Wikipedia, uh, since uh, the, the Egyptians in the time of the pyramids were uh, doing multiplication by additions, but you needed a lot of additions. Uh, I think of it as Russian peasants' multiplication. Uh, uh, in, in binary, it's really just shift and add. Uh, so it's, it's possible to avoid having a, a multiplier circuit, but um, the trick is you can't use too many additions to replace a multiplication, and that's what this algorithm is about. Uh, okay. So first of all, uh, 10 years ago this might not have been interesting, but right now... Uh, you know, all of the deep learning algorithms uh, uh, in, involve multiplication of large, uh, typically very sparse matrices. Uh, and in fact, people are spending so much time effectively doing matrix multiplication 
that um, it's become a, a serious issue to develop what are called accelerator chips. They're things that are designed to do one thing and one thing only and do it really, really well. Uh, my understanding is that there are more than 100 startups doing this kind of thing. Uh, and uh, I'm going to try to argue that um, if you could design a chip that didn't have a scalar multiplier circuit, um, you might actually be able to do matrix multiplication faster. That's, that's, that's the whole idea. Um, okay, uh, for, first of all, um, uh, you know, again, there, there are all sorts of designs, so it, it's, it's hard to say exactly how long things take, but on most chips, probably the chip in your, um, in your laptop, um, an integer multiplication, sorry, an integer addition will take one cycle and, and, a, a, and an integer multiplication will take three or four cycles. So uh, if we could do with fewer than three additions to replace one multiplication, we might actually have a speed up. Um, I, I, okay, normally you, you want to think of, um, let's say, these matrix elements as floating point numbers, uh, but I'm not... Now, okay, and here's, again, here, here's the, the annoying thing. Um, floating point multiplication takes more or less the same time as integer multiplication. Because you just multiply the mantises, you have to add the exponents, and then there's a shift maybe of one bit. Uh, integer, uh, sorry, floating point addition takes about as much time and, and space on the chip as, uh, as floating point multiplication because you don't just add the mantises, you have to first align them based on what the difference of the exponents is. Uh, okay, uh, anyway, uh, it's also true, let's say, again, there are all sorts of ways to do a, a multiplier circuit, but uh, you can't both be very small on the chip and very fast, okay? So um, if, let's say, a multiplier circuit takes twice the space of an, of an addition circuit, then you've got maybe a factor of six to work with. So if you can do uh, mul uh, multiplication in fewer than six additions, you might have a win. And, and again, I'm, uh, you can, in fact, I'm going to show you you can do much better. Okay. Uh, well, as I said, uh, again, it's, this is not the first time people have been uh, using addition as a substitute for mul multiplication. Um, the, uh, the trouble is you have, if you have b-bit numbers, uh, then on the average, if you, let's say, really what you're doing is shift and add again in, in binary. So uh, you're going to have to add roughly b over 2 copies of the multiplicand uh, to, uh, to, to, get, uh, to, to get, the, uh, get the product. Um, okay, you know, well, okay, here, here's a picture uh, where you shift the multiplicand, uh, you write down a zero if the multiplier has a zero in that bit, and, a, and you write down the multiplicand if, it's, if, it's, uh, if the multiplier has a one, and then you add them up. Now, uh, it, it always, because you don't know where the non-zero element's going to be, you have to sort of start off with zero and then add in the multiplicand shifted. So I'd say this is really a three addition process, not two. Uh, Anyway, matrix multiplication. So you want to multiply two matrices, A and B, and, and get an answer C. Uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to assume that N is, uh, so that these are square, all square matrices. They're N by N. Uh, and again, I'll assume that they're dense, but in fact, N could be sort of the average number of non-zero elements in, in a row or column uh, if the matrices are sparse. Um, okay, so the usual notation, I'm going to do the element in row I and column J of a matrix will be denoted by that matrix name sub IJ. Uh, 
and then you have essentially each output element, say i k, is the dot product of the um, of the i-th row of the first matrix A and the the uh, uh, and the k-th row of the uh, k-th column sorry, of the um, second matrix. So, so in pictures, the dot product looks like that. Okay, that's what, yeah, pretty pretty simple minded, right? Okay, so here's um, here's the normal algorithm for uh, doing matrix multiplication. Um, the first lines uh, are just just to, again to just zero all of the uh, of the output elements, and then um, in a, a double loop on i and k, you visit each output element, and then there's an inner loop on j that takes the dot product uh, of uh, of that of, of the the, uh, uh, the row of a in the column of of b. Now, um, because the inner loop is just addition, it's associative and commutative, you can reorder the loops. So what I've done here is simply move the loop on J out to the, uh, to the, to the outside. And now what you're doing is, uh, for each value of J, you're computing the Jth outer product. Um, Okay, and I don't think that I, I don't think any of them really work for sparse matrices, and and of course the the you know the constants, uh, you know the sort of the, the the lower the exponent, the higher the the constant factor. So I've not really seen uh, even Strassen's algorithm of being a serious contender for. Uh, for, a, for an accelerator chip. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, anyway, uh, so the, the, the outer product, what, what you're really doing is you're taking the outer product of column of J, uh, column J of, of A with the, the corresponding row J of B, and then you got to get it because N squared uh, elements in, the, in that outer product. Okay, um, so uh, I really only have to explain how do you take an outer product uh, without uh, without doing any scalar multiplication, um, and then uh, you know just in the, the ordinary way it's it's done. You're going to sum the elements of the outer products to uh, the, the, the n outer products. They will be summed, and uh, and that that produces the result. Uh, okay, so um, here's the first thing we're going to do. is so We're going to take the jth row of the second matrix, uh, B, and we're going to sort it and eliminate duplicates. Okay, now you might say, well, that's not even a linear time algorithm, but there are only n rows, so the total time spent uh, on, um, uh, on sorting is just n squared log n. So that that's not gonna uh, that's not gonna be the killer. Um, okay, and then once we've processed the, this this jth row of B, we will in sequence multiply multiply that row by each of the constants in the jth uh, in the jth column of of A. Uh, so, uh, so here's here's the first step. What we've done is we st we started with a vector of b1 to bn. That could be the jth row of b, or since this is a recursive algorithm, it could be some other uh, some other vector. Uh, it's the, it's not important, but we we will sort it and eliminate duplicates. When we eliminate duplicates, you've got of course the changes the length. Uh, m would be uh, at least equal to less than n, and we have to remember what we've done. Uh, so, in particular, you've got a, a vector of pointers where the uh, p sub i tells me where v sub i has gone in the in the sorted uh, uh, list s. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the first step. 
Then we take, we take the sorted vector and we take differences of the consecutive elements. Uh, so as an example here, to start with some random numbers, uh, sort them and eliminate duplicates. And now we'll take the, the consecutive differences. And, and I know I have to sort of append a zero. When I take the difference, I want to append a zero to the list uh, just so that I, I capture the, the last element of the sorted list, the smallest element of the sorted list. If I don't do that, uh, then, then I, I can't recover the sorted list from its differences. Now, again, he, here's the thing that, that will completely, uh, well, um, uh, okay. Uh, now again, as I said, it's, re it's a recursive algorithm. So um, you now have a new, a new list, 41121. You can proceed to do the same thing on it. Uh, you, you sort, eliminate duplicates, take the differences. And do it, keep just doing it over and over again. The, again, the thing that, that completely surprised me, at least, was, was this, the, the difference vector is, is very much more constrained than the, um, than the original list. So if the original list um, was uh, integer, well, let's say integers in the range 1 to k, or let's say, let's say 1 to 9, then the sum of the elements of the difference list will be at most 9. Uh, in that case, it is, it is exactly 9. Okay. So, um, again, so you're, you're, you're sort of squeezing, very quickly squeezing down how many different elements there can be in these lists. Okay. So, uh, anyway, here's, uh, so, so here, here's the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the whole recursive step. Uh, you, you, we've so, sorted, eliminate duplicates, and then we, we take differences. Uh, and now, this is done, again, once for each, uh, each row of the, that second matrix. And now we're going to use this structure to, to get the product C, for any constant C, C times the vector V. That's, what, that's, that's our goal. Okay. Uh, and so the, the, next, the next part of the algorithm gets done once for each element in the column, the jth column of, of, of A. Okay. So it, as I said, okay, you, you can keep iterating recursively. So here's, here's the picture. Uh, Okay, so we start off with, with uh, the digits of pi, sorted, eliminated duplicates, took the difference list, sorted the difference list, and eliminated the duplicates. Uh, and, and as you can see, it, 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 it looks like it takes a long time to get down to a, a list of length one. Which we, typically, it'll be one. If you started with numbers, let's say, that were all multiples of three, then you'd wind up with a list that was just three. Uh, now, the um, again, this doesn't you know it looks like it's a lot of work going on, but in fact, that's only because this is a very small example. Okay, uh, suppose instead of the first six digits of pi, I took the first hundred digits of pi. What would happen? Well, all the digits would appear in the list, so the differences would all be one. And that would and, and you just you just jump right to the end. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, one of the, th the the takeaways is that this algorithm is really only designed for big matrices. For little matrices, it doesn't really work. I mean, or, you know, it doesn't it's not a, it's not a good algorithm. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, so the idea is we're going to run the, this, this recursion for a couple of steps. Finally, when, the, when, when things get down to something really small, uh, you can just use, let's say, Russian peasants multiplication and, and just, just get the product of that that's very small vector with any constant you like. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so now I want to show you how you multiply, you know, having you know, set up this recursive sequence of, of, of lists, of vectors, um, how, do you, how, do you, uh, how do you multiply everything by, uh, by any constant c? Okay. So again, for the basis, just use uh, the Russian peasants. For the recursion, well, uh, magically, we've taken the difference list D. Again, this is again, part of recursion. The recursion has managed magically to multiply each of the differences uh, di by this constant C. Gives me another vector D prime. Okay. Uh, I can then accumulate the differences. This is where the additions come in. Okay. Uh, uh, that is, so, so C, C times SM, since SM is just DM, uh, CSM is just D, DSM, and then you just, you just keep, keep adding up the elements of, of, of the DIs to get a new uh, product, uh, which I'll call S prime. And now you have to use those pointers that were set up initially to figure out how to convert the this the vector s prime into the product of the original vector v uh, times the constant c. So what I'm going to do for each i, let's say I'll follow the pointer p i, that tells me where which uh, which s j is v i. And then I look in the corresponding position of the vector s prime, and that gives me c s j. And that's C V I. Okay, so I have to do I have to do cop I have to basically copy the um, uh, uh, I copy the vector S prime into the in, into the vector of V prime, which is, is the answer, and that that gives me any product and any product of any C times uh, the original vector V. Um, now, th th there's more, actually, um, again, Daniel has looked at a lot of different, uh, different variations, and I, I'm just going to tell you about one of them. Um, uh, you see, you, you can sort of speed up the algorithm, uh, and, you know, if you're thinking in terms of big O and, and so ordinary, you know, software uh, computation, doesn't really matter. When you, um, when you try to design a chip, you have to sort of worry about you need more circuitry to do it, and that takes space and, and so on. So it's, it's a little tricky as to whether this is, is actually a useful idea, but uh, it's simple enough. Uh, the idea is, and since everything's in binary, uh, you, you, can, you, you can lop off trailing zero. So uh, if I can produce uh, three times any constant, then it's in binary. And so if I need to, to, to get 12 times that constant, I can just shift to two places uh, right. Uh, okay. Well, uh, I, I think that's, that's obvious. Um, now, uh, again, the extra circuitry you need now is if, if you're going to align as we can lop off trailing zeros before you sort, you're going to have fewer numbers, and particularly they'll all be odd. Uh, but now you have to remember not only where you put each, L, each of the original elements in the sorted list, but how many positions you shifted, if any. Um, okay, well, I, I think this is obvious. So, so uh, you know, for example, if, if uh, you lock two zeros off of some integer x. Uh, you're only com you're computing c times y, which is x over four. Uh, you, you have to shift back, uh, sh shift left two positions to get c times x. Uh, and, and, and as I said, uh, the nice thing is that all the integer when when you sort it, all the integers are odd, and therefore all the differences will be even, except maybe the last one. Um, okay, so uh, just, just to show you, 
you know, just how powerful this technique really is in, in practice. What we did was, um, well, first of all, we worked on with 24-bit integers. Now, 24 bits is not a sort of random number, but it's the effective number of bits in the mantises of single position floating point. So, um, so it's a reasonable thing to, to think about. So, and so we generated n random numbers in the range, in the range uh, one to um, one to uh, two to the twenty-fourth minus one. Uh, and um, uh, okay, and we did this for for n ranging from a thousand to a million, uh, and then uh, again we we took the we, well we we just took a look at how long the lists are at each at each stage of the recursion, and and this is what we get. Uh, now let's see, I, I don't think I have a pointer. But um, OK, if you look at the top, uh, we have a, a vector of, a thought with a vector of length 1,000. OK, now remember, uh, 2 to the 24th is about 16 million. Okay. So take 1,000 random numbers between 1 and 16 million. You're not going to get, on average, even one overlap. They'll all be unique. Uh, so that's why the first entry in column A is 1,000. That's, that's, that's how long the list is after we sort and eliminate duplicates. Even in the second row, we're talking about, again, and there's 1,000, but now we've done alignment. So we've, we've, again, lopped off trailing zeros. Now there are only really 8 million different possible numbers. Still, 1,000 random numbers chosen from 1 to 8 million. Uh, you're not going to get an even one uh, overlap. Now, let's look at column B, which is what happens when we work with the difference list. Okay, now, remember, initially, your numbers are between 1 and 16 million. Um, so the difference is, on average, or thousand, take 1,000 random numbers, on average, the difference is be around 16,000. So let's, let's say that most of the numbers in the difference list are going to be let's say, between 1 and 32,000. OK, so now, when you take 1,000 numbers at random from in that range, uh, 1 to 32,000, you would tend to get a few overlaps. And as you can see, you've got, on average, you get 15 uh, collisions. So, so the second difference, when we process the sort and eliminate duplicates from the difference list, you only have 985. If you've done alignment, which again reduces things still further, uh, you get only 871. So we're still, we're still not doing very well. But by the third iteration, now, if let's say if the numbers were one range 1 to 32,000 and you uh, pick 1,000 at random, the average difference now will be 32. So when you throw, uh, a thousand numbers that are more or less in the range one to the thirty-two, you're going to get lots of overlaps. And as you can see, it's now down to two twenty-eight. Um, and um, the last column tells you basically how many uh, how many additions you need uh, to simulate one multiplication. And and it's uh, well with alignment without alignment, it's almost three. You do alignment; it's a little more than two. Not, not all that great. Um, now, if you do, if you have a million numbers, even the first time, a right, million random numbers in the range of one to sixteen million, you start to get lots of, uh, you know, lots of collisions. Uh, by the second round, you've got the numbers are very tiny, and as you can see, it's all it, it just tails off very, very quickly. Okay. Uh, Notice, for, uh, for a length n equals a million, you actually use fewer than one addition per multiplication. And that's because the duplicates dominate everything. Okay. Uh, now, you still need a million copies. Okay. Uh, so, um, you know, you know, but, you know, uh, and, and that's going to cost you something too on on, on the chip. Uh, but 
Uh, but the, 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 the point is, it's, it's um, um, you know, there's, it's, it's startlingly few additions are, are, are needed when the matrices are really big. Okay. So I wanted to try to sketch the proof of an upper bound. And, um, I, well, it, I'm going I'm, I'm to try to solve, and really I failed to solve, um, a, a, a recurrence, um, but uh, we can still get something out of it. Okay, and the, the cast of characters, first of all, let C of n and k be the thing we've been talking about. It's how many, the maximum number of additions that you're going to need to, uh, uh, to multiply a vector of length n by a constant. Uh, given that the elements of the vector are integers in the range 1 to k. And then d, d of n and k is sort of the thing that characterizes what the, dis, the difference lists look like. So you have, again, uh, a vector of n elements, but, uh, again, I'm, assume, I'm going to assume alignment uh, that makes the bound a little tighter, although not, not much. Uh, it, it's not really essential. Uh, so I'm going to assume that the elements are odd and, and that they're distinct, so we've eliminated duplicates. And the sum, now not, not the in, and elements individually, but the sum of the elements is at least k. It is high at most k. Well, there are a couple of uh, observations we can make. First of all, a c of n k is at most d of n and k plus n. That's the basic recursive step. It says we can take differences and then with at most n additions, could be uh, less. Uh, and, and by the way, when you look at this, you'll notice uh, this analysis gives away a lot, okay, uh, just to make it simple. Uh, okay, but certainly you need at most n additions to do the accumulation, and that's, that's the only place where you use the additions. Now, the second one is really a thought experiment. It's not, um, it, it has nothing to do with the algorithm itself. Um, uh, I'm going to take, again, a vector summing to k. And uh, I'm, I'm going to divide the elements into the little elements and the big elements. And, and this parameter x I'm not, uh, can be anything. Uh, but I'll say an element's little if it's at most x, and it's big if it's greater than x. So, um, well, you can see the, the, the occurrence is for any x, okay, the d of n and k is at most c of n and x plus d of length k over x and, and k. That is, um, the, the, first, the, fir the first term represents the cost of multiplying the little elements by a constant. That is, we know they're all at most x. Uh, and, um, and, and, they're, and they're certainly at most n of them, because they're at most n in the whole, whole list. So again, it's, you see it's giving away a lot, but, but it's certainly a safe bound. Uh, so c of n and x will, takes care of the cost of multiplying the little elements. And then the big elements, there can't be too many of them. Right. The sum is k, and if each one of them is at least x, there can't be more than k over x with them. So that's where you get d of a length uh, k over x. Uh, and they're all, again, at most k, because all the elements are at most k. Uh, the, the, the second, uh, again, this is, this is where we're really we're, we're taking advantage of, um, of the assumption that, there, that I did alignment. Uh, the sum of the first square root of k odd distinct integers is exactly k. So uh, if k is small, n can't be that big. Okay. Um, and then uh, the, there's the obvious bound with uh, the Russian peasants. Um, so here, here's the theorem. I'm not going to prove it, uh, but uh, well, you can just you can just see the formula there. Uh, uh, 
what does it mean? Again, if k is, 20, is sorry, if k is two to the twenty-fourth, then um, uh, well, at most two one, well two additions per multiplication are sufficient as long as n is well a rather big number, one hundred forty-seven thousand, so on. What, uh, what is k? K, k? k again is the uh, is the is the, the, the is the upper bound on any, on any element of the vector. Okay. Um, again, so if, if you're talking about 24-bit numbers, then k is 2 to the 24th, actually 2 to the 24th minus 1. Uh, OK, uh, you, for 3n three, three additions, well, the 3 additions per multiplication, as long as n is uh, over 10,000, uh, 4 suffice for n equals uh, 3840 or, or more. And again, this is, this is a, a loose but correct uh, up, upper, upper bound. And it's considerably more than the, exp the, the random experiments uh, show. Uh, OK, so uh, again, the, the, to prove it, all you do is you, st you start with C of nk. That's what you want to, what you want to bound. And you, you alternate rule one, which is the recursion in the algorithm. And then rule two, where you break things into big and little elements, big and little elements, you just keep alternating, and um, uh, then uh, you have to end with the last uh, 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 last recursion. Rule three, the thing that that says uh, if the sum is, if if you sum of uh, odd integers is is this is the square of the number of integers. Uh, you need that to bound one of the d terms, uh, and then you have to pick the x's to, to balance everything out so that, so that um, all the, the sum of the term, the, the terms that you get in the expansion are, are minimized, and that's uh, that's not that hard. Uh, and then uh, you know just you round it off with um, uh, with the Russian peasants multiplication, and you get this uh, the the bound that I gave you. Uh, okay. So anyway, uh, the um, you know the, just to, to sum it up, the the algorithm is really good when you're dealing with big matrices and the numbers in those matrices are not uh, are not too big, and that's exactly what seems to be uh, happening in machine learning. Uh, for example, uh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with with the 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 tensor processing unit. Uh, while they can handle larger uh, numbers, what they actually do is, is um, they, they use 16, 16 bits as the default. Okay. Um, uh, now, uh, you know, the fact is, I've, I've talked to people who, who should know uh, whether it's feasible to build a chip. Uh, and uh, what they tell me is, you know, you got to get a good chip designer and see what they can do with it. Uh, so uh, it, I think it's it's completely open as to whether this is a um, a useful idea or or, or not. Uh, I, I I hope it is. But uh, anyway, with that, I'll let you go. And, Thanks a lot, Jeff. Great. Appreciate it. Um, you, you, you see, it, it, well, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we did the software simulation. That's what the, the, the table of random numbers is. But, but it doesn't tell you anything because you, you got to, if, look, if you had a chip design, you could s simulate it in software. You wouldn't have to actually fabricate it. But you got to make the chip design. And, and again, the algorithmic ideas in chip design are just not the same as the things that we know and love. Except there are lots of quantum chips. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, how do we look at the, the whole thread of all these uh, CPUs, which are very much quite regularized, regularized in memory access in the world? Even with lots of quantum moves, it's very strange to talk to. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, may, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, man, I agree that that you you probably need to do a lot of this stuff in parallel. And, and as you say, it's, it's, you know, if you do the same thing many places, you're, you're, uh, you're, you're, that's probably the right way to do it. But um, uh, again, no, nobody, you know, it's not a good, good argument, but no, nobody has dismissed this completely. I mean, there's no... Um, Yeah. <laughs> you see, see, it depends. If you can do it sort of in the, uh, while you're doing something else, the cost is zero in, t in terms of, of time. Obviously, you, you, you need cheap real estate to move things around. Uh, yeah, in, in fact, um, uh, okay, also, M M Moshe, remember, the pointer following is, uh, is something you only do n squared times, not n cubed times. So, so, you know, you, you, you may be right, and, and it's still not, you know, except, you know, except it keeps coming, it keep, I keep coming back to the point, it's not just the time it takes, it's also the real estate on, on the chip. You know, so, you know, can we do with, uh, you know, all the point you're following can, can happen using the same circuit at different Times, uh, uh, and you know one of the one of the intuitive things is you want the chip to run hot. That is, everything's you know every part of the chip is is doing something at all times, right? Um, yeah. Again, I, I you know I, I I wish when I was an undergraduate at Columbia I studied more electrical engineering, uh, except they were teaching vacuum tubes at the time, so <laughs> it probably wouldn't help. Uh, Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to thank a lot. First of all, the organizers that they give me the opportunity to be in that fest uh, to honor uh, my advisor, Michalis. Uh, in the next fest, either Michalis or Rocco fest, I will ask the, uh, the the guy that is making the schedule. Don't ask me to give a talk in smooth analysis exactly before the guy that uh, <laughs> introduced the model. <laughs> but yeah. Um, okay, so uh, if I am correct, probably I am, uh, because I am the last baby of that family, uh, I mean, graduated baby. Um, uh, so, so stop. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, yeah, uh, I would like a little bit to tell you, uh, the majority of you, you, you know very well. Uh, Michalis as a researcher, but uh, I would like a little bit to share some first memories about how it was Michalis as a teacher. Uh, so uh, I will tell you a discussion that have been uh, in uh, 516 room. Uh, this is a very famous room. Everyone there has become an academic. Uh, and uh, it was a discussion between me and uh, Marcel. Uh, Marcel Bull is right now assistant professor in NYU. And uh, I, I really f had the fortune to, to be uh, one of the students of the last time that Michalis uh, taught the class of approximation algorithms. And here is a discussion. So I, I told to Marshall, Marshall, have you ever taken Michalis approximation class? And his answer is yes, Michalis is, is like a walking treasure. Uh, you know, you, you have a discuss with him and you, you dig always gold. And I told him the following, okay, I agree, but I want to ask you something about the actual class. In his class, everything feels so simple uh, until 
Yeah, and uh, Marshall stopped me and he said, yeah, I know, I, I know what do you mean, until the time that you will pick up again the book. Uh, this is not offensive against the book. The book is very nice, but uh, yeah, w when you open the book, about the exactly same material that you s just uh, learned, uh, you suddenly uh, describe the, the, discover that it is again challenging. And uh, I was commenting that, yeah, but in Michalis' course, there was nothing like waving. It was full of formalism. And uh, yeah, like uh, the, the expression of Marshall was amazing. He said, when you are in the class of Michalis, you feel that uh, I don't understand why these materials are in a postgraduate uh, course. They are so easy. And then when you are going back and you open the book, you, you, you say, wait, I was in the class. I didn't remember it to be so difficult. That, that, that was the, and like at the end of the discussion, that, that was our uh, common mentioning, that we hope that in our life it will become academic, because one part of the academy is to teach well and to inspire by your teaching, really to be, uh, to teach like Michalis. That, that was one of the most amazing personal experiences that I have as a student of Michalis. Now, Michalis as a, a research advisor, okay, uh, I will phrase it with that way, you come in Columbia, uh, you are like the valedictorian, great scores from your undergrad, and you say, okay, I will go to a, a good uh, professor, I will uh, learn some techniques, I will write a, a follow-up paper. You know that always you can uh, solve uh, all the problems at 3 a.m. if you put some effort. But, okay, there is in the library always some solution. And then you meet Michalis and you understand that all of those things are false and uh, you understand that the, the, the real research is something different. The, the real research, the, this is like the most important lesson that I took, and it was an interesting lesson. It wasn't something that you, you learn by preaching, uh, that you have to be devoted, persistent. Uh, the humbleness of Michalis at any problem, uh, at any contribution, it was amazing. Uh, and. Michalis was always enjoying only answering deep questions, like uh, you, you, he, he was never accepting something less than this, that it, it was very useful to have the correct standard while you are doing your PhD. And uh, if, I, if I want to say the last thing that I would like to say about his advising is the following, like M Michalis has an intriguing way uh, that it is exactly like Socrates, like uh, you learn in, in, uh, in working with Michalis, you learn how to ask questions, how to ask questions again and again with a very devoted way. Uh, and uh, what I would like to say is th these are all the areas that I have work on them. These are not papers that uh, um, are uh, necessarily with Michalis, but Michalis offered me the, the most important gift that someone could give to, uh, to a student. An important question, like every time that I was working, there was uh, in the back of my mind th that question. Why do simple algorithms work so well even in these uh, challenging settings like machine learning, RL, etc.? Uh, Michalis gave me that question and I think that th this question gave me a reason that, ah, theory is something interesting. So the, the, that kept me really uh, in the area uh, of theoretical computer science. So, okay, speaking about ancient Greeks and uh, passing to the main. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's start with the question. Okay, how many? Uh, here is a, a convex body uh, that it is composed by regular pentagons and hexagons. Let's make a quiz. How many of you do you believe that that element exists? Hands for yes. For yes. Come on. Uh, I'm, okay. How many of you, you say no? The rest you don't have opinion. Okay. Yes, if you would like to ask. Okay. So here is the point. Conceptually, the answer is yes. So let me give you some background. The ancient Greek loved really the idea of uh, uh, the polytops with uh, regular polygons. They had the, the idea that uh, the, the main elements, fire, earth, uh, um, like the atoms are somehow like uh, composed by regular uh, polygons. So here is the story. Uh, Archimedes, Plato, etc. in their cosmology, they described uh, the, these uh, constructions. 
Now, uh, Normal Johnson, uh, an American guy, uh, identified actually 92 uh, Johnson solids, as they call it. So they took all the list of the ancient uh, polytopes. Uh, they put all the um, uh, rotations, all the equivalence classes. He, he uh, declared a list of 92 solids, and he said, uh, OK, uh, probably this is the only thing that you can create with regular polygons. Uh, if you want to have uh, convex bodies. And after some years, Zalgaler, uh, a Soviet uh, mathematician, said, look, this list is complete. So from that list, that image says that cannot be existed. Like that, uh, that thing that looks like the most basic uh, <laughs> football uh, ball cannot exist. Uh, and now the, the question is the following. Okay. What did we miss? Because actually, if you go to the internet, there was a computer vision uh, professor uh, from Canada that created that thing. And if I ask you to go at your home and just create it, you will achieve it. And you will believe that, like, take regular uh, hexagons and polygons, and you will make it. So the idea is that th there, are, there are imperfections in the real world, like maybe something would not be so regular, the angles. So, the Sopian morale of uh, that story is the following. The impact of the impossibility results, like the Zalgaler uh, result in the real world, is strongly connected with uh, their robustness under the presence of noise. Uh, and here are the standard five minutes of uh, smooth analysis motivation. Uh, typically, the computer engineer uh, outside, they are just happy if they create an algorithm that runs well uh, in a good amount of time. Uh, in all the practical instances. In contrast, the theoreticians say, OK, I would like to, to be happy and give a guarantee that even in the worst case, everything goes well in polynomial time for all the instances. And now the question is, is theory always consistent with practice? Now, uh, this is a motto that I created uh, while I, I remember a rainy day here in uh, Colombia. And I say, OK, that is something important. If you want to create a mathematical theory that explains what is happening in the real life, in the mathematical theory, you have to incorporate a model, a perfect model, that express the imperfections of that world. And like, if we go back to the algorithms, here is the most prominent algorithm design that we know that has this paradoxical phenomenon. Like, if you go to the ML people and you ask them, can you cluster? They believe that it is so easy. Now, any interesting version of clustering is NP-complete. TSP is NP-complete problem. Uh, everyone loves, uh, in theory, the fact that linear programming uh, is in P, but it is in P because of ellipsoid and other methods, not because of simplex, that in the worst case it is exponential time. The, call, the, the local exchange of TSP, that is the main method of Markov um, chain, Monte Carlo, uh, can take exponential time. The k-means can take exponential time, but in practice they work. So uh, when is an algorithm really considered efficient? This is the main question. Now, OK, the caveat is that in the worst case analysis, you give me just one example that it is, I should be very myopic and say, OK, this example that it is super fragile, if I change it a little bit, all the idea uh, is destroyed, uh, is very pessimistic. Now, the average case analysis is too optimistic because uh, you destroy all the structure of the problem, and you say, OK, I will sample something random. And uh, let's see what is happening with uh, various structure instances. Uh, so he here is the image. Imagine that you have like a landscape of, uh, th this is, le let's say, the running time, or the space that you need in your model. And like this is the input space, and you are running an algorithm, and here is your observation. So the average case of that algorithm is like almost in the bottom, the worst case is uh, just uh, sorted by the worst case. And the question is if we are fair about our uh, calculations. Um, I, should, uh, yeah, I, I should cite it that some of the slides are from this amazing guy that proposed the model. Okay? So uh, Daniel Spielberg and Sam Hua Teng, uh, they are in 2001, right? Uh, OK. Uh, uh, <laughs> The, the end, the Gettle Prize about proposing uh, the smooth uh, analysis model. So let's see what is the idea. 
Uh, the idea is like, this is the worst case analysis that I will give you the, uh, an instance and I want to take, uh, I will um, classify my algorithm with the worst case um, uh, performance. This is the average case instance that I, I will just take the expectation over the, all the instances. And now the smooth analysis is like uh, an interpolation between those methods. So I, for every instance, I will put some perturbation and uh, I will try to find out in the worst case what is happening after the nature will add the perturbation, okay? And now, from an electrical engineer perspective, if someone would like to understand what, why they call it smooth uh, complexity, my understanding is like you apply a filter and now the complexity uh, of every point is defined by an average around the area. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so, one last comment. Why smooth analysis is not just another idea of the average case analysis? So this is a problem that I'm trying to tackle in my uh, postdoc. Uh, don't expect to be an easy problem. Uh, like I'm student of Michalis, okay? Uh, okay, the best algorithm to solve a linear, prog a linear uh, system, uh, I don't know if Josh is here, you can ask him in TCS, it's not Gaussian elimination. But if you run something in MATLAB, it will be Gaussian elimination. But Gaussian elimination, in the worst case, can take uh, exponential time. The reason is that while you are doing the calculation, the n to the cube, the, the numbers can explode in the bit expression. So uh, that will make the whole algorithm exponential. Now, if you do global pivoting, that it is whenever you are doing the, um, the, the linear calculations, you choose the line with uh, the smallest or the biggest uh, um, number in row and in column, then it is known that it is always polynomial. If you choose random pivoting, I think that was from one uh, of the first PhD students of uh, Dan, uh, that is uh, smoothly polynomial. For the partial pivoting, that it is the main algorithm that you learn in the numerical analysis, just last year there was an average case polynomial, but we don't have a smooth uh, case analysis. And something as a gift to Christos, uh, if you want to see why smooth analysis is different from average case analysis, here is a cognitive understanding of that. They were trying to understand how many of you, you know Magnus Carlson, Hans? Okay. Well, uh, this is an amazing Czech, ma uh, Czech master. So uh, they were trying to understand uh, the powerful, uh, the power of the memory of the chess masters. And here is what they did. They, they gave to a chess, uh, to, to three different people, a master, a class A player, and a beginner, uh, like uh, a chess board. And they asked him, uh, asked them, look, uh, try to memorize them in five seconds and replicate them. So in random boards, like, just choose pawns randomly and put them. Uh, both of the three players, uh, they were equivalent in their performances. When the players, uh, the, the chessboards are something like, we have a seed in the computer, we play the game, we create an arbitrary game, and then we give it to, uh, to the master, to the class player, and to the beginner, then we have the, the correct classification. That, that, that is like the cognitive version of what is the difference between the uh, smooth analysis and the average analysis. So going back to a uh, more TCS perspective, if we want to say like uh, the, the big problem that not only a mail that I'm writing there, but uh, in any TCS problem is like, I want to find the minimizer, okay? I want to, to, to find and next, that minimize some penalty function. Now, uh, a moment of truth. Uh, the problem of finding exactly a minimizer, even if the problem is convex, could be and be hard because uh, of the details of the exactness. It could be undecidable. It could have uh, irrational results. Uh, so the typical relaxation that we follow is the following. First of all, we say, OK, we want an epsilon approximation. And the second thing that we ask is, okay, in the majority of the cases, maybe if the problem is too hard, I would like to be delta, delta local, meaning I don't want to solve the problem really. I want to be to solve the problem in a small region. Now, why that is good in practice? Uh, the idea is that in the majority of the cases in real life, we have this phenomenon that the local equilibria, the local uh, minimum points, uh, are 
in their performance very close to the global ones. We don't have what we call uh, in optimization lots of spurious local minima that I, okay, I found that one and the real performance is that one. So in many machine learning problems you, you avoid that technique. So finding the local optimum is enough sufficient. So going now to more Michal stuff. Uh, let's assume that we want to tackle the problem of combinatorial local optimization. So in the most primitive way that you can think about it, I have a max sat, I have like a series of clauses, I have some weights about every clause, and I want to find an assignment that will give me uh, lots of money. Um, a bit capitalistic. Okay, yeah. Uh, so w what is a local minimum? A flip k local minimum is the following. I give you the, that assignment and the property is that even if I try to change uh, that assignment uh, by k variables or less, uh, the value that I get uh, is uh, the best one. So I'm local optimum over this uh, uh, n to the k different perturbations, okay? So the today problems that I will try to discuss is the following. This is a joint work with Michalis, uh, another amazing guy that I met here, an, an amazing professor, Si Chen, and uh, two friends that I earned, uh, Chen Hao and Xi Zi Zhang. Um, so the problem, we will start with uh, the local max cut, then we will see what is happening. The local max cut is the classical problem that I have like a, a, a weighted undirected graph and I want to, part, uh, by part, to create a bipartite situation and I will collect the, the weight uh, in the middle. Uh, okay, now flip one algorithm is the basic algorithm, the, basically, the basic family of algorithms for the flip one local minimum. So what is that algorithm? As long as there is a, um, uh, there is a better assignment, I will choose a node that if I will flip it, I will get a better assignment. I say a family because the switching criterion could be every time different. Like you can take the maximum, you can take the, the minimum improvement, a random improvement. So it's a whole family of different algorithms. Then you can have the flip two situation. The flip two is I will apply the one move as long as I have an improvement. And then I, I can apply the two move, uh, which is Okay, with just one improvement, I'm not good enough, but if I apply uh, two of them, the, then uh, I have an improvement. Uh, again, the, switch, the, the, the way that I will choose the, the pairs, uh, it's open. And uh, you can have like, uh, if you are speaking about a very similar problem that is the bisection, but I'm just uh, creating the bipartite graph and I'm doing swapping. So necessarily, I'm just doing a flip two. Uh, it's exactly the same problem. So, the, but the algorithm is called swap. So let's start with the basics. We want to find a flip uh, k local. What is the complexity of that? Uh, this is Johnson, Michalis, and Christos, if I am correct. And this is Christos and Michalis. Uh, finding flip k local max in the max sat is PLS complete. Now, uh, a byproduct of uh, this result is that any algorithm that you will create has an exponential uh, worst case uh, scenario. Like, uh, given that we have the PLS completeness, it, it means that there is an instance that if I run the, the flip algorithm, it will take exponential time. And now let's, let's see what is happening with the smooth complexity. Uh, first of all, let's see the full perturbation uh, model, and I will explain what I say with that. So let's assume that you have a graph. Now the graph, it's not necessarily complete, it's not a click, but uh, the, the idea is that I have to add some noise. Now, even in the edges that I don't have the noise, uh, I will uh, put some weight in these edges, so I will create them with uh, a negligible but existent noise. So that is the reason that the full perturbation model directly speaks about the complete graph, okay? And in the most general case, uh, we have that at every edge, I will put some weight that um, has a bounded density. Now to understand a little bit, th this parameter, I will hide it in the, uh, in the top, but uh, it is an important parameter. So imagine that if you have like the Gaussian distribution, that it is something like the inverse of the variance. So if the variance is very small, uh, then I'm, getting the Dirac, so I'm getting the worst case. If the variance is uh, huge, I get the uniform distribution. So 
why I try to be a little bit formal here. This is a model that uh, Daniel and uh, Tank uh, used to prove this uh, simplex method. Uh, so you have in, in your uh, linear program you have uh, the matrix and you add a random uh, matrix without trying to protect anything, without trying to protect the zeros of the matrix. Now why I say that because in the linear program sometimes the zeros, there are also other integers but it's just an example, like the zeros could mean I don't participate in this constraint. So. Uh, this is like a very interesting model, but uh, the, this is the criticism that exists also in this model. And as I said, like uh, the, while you are going from one side to the other side uh, in this parameter, you interpolate between the worst case and the smooth case. And the goal is to find out the worst case in the in this uh, randomization uh, randomized instance. Uh, now the structure perturbation model is the following: I give you the graph. And now I will perturb only the, the I will perturb only the um, uh, the weights of the edges that exist. I will not create anything else. So for this model, only uh, we know only quasi polynomial analysis. The best is one that we have with Michalis. It is open problem first of all for the simplex, but it is like the big uh, the, the starting problem to to find a version of a simplex like a a switching rule, a pivoting rule, that will give you a, a quasi-polynomial time. Uh, I'm just uh, even optimistic for that, for the structure model. In other words, that I will add a random matrix with, uh, that will not violate the zeros. Uh, a recent work uh, shows that the shadow vertex uh, method, this is a work from uh, Sophie Huibert, this postdoc of uh, team, uh, Rock Garden, I saw, the, yeah, hi team, uh, with uh, Yi Tan Li and Xin Zhi Zhang. Uh, and they saw that for the shadow vertex uh, model, uh, you have super polynomial lower bounds. So for the structural model, we don't have a method that it is uh, polynomial right now. Uh, so let's go back to the, the local max cut. Uh, the first result, it was in uh, at 2011, uh, that says the following. If the diameter of the graph, or arbitrary graph, structured case. Uh, if the diameter is uh, log n, then the flip one runs uh, smoothly polynomial. Uh, the first seminal work in this uh, problem, at silent Rogling, uh, they said for arbitrary graph and structured model, I will give you a quasi-polynomial time. Then they say if you have Euclidean metric and structure model, then it is smoothly polynomial. Then we have a, a paper from Angel, Bubek, uh, Yuval Perez, and Qui uh, from in, at Stock that they say for the full perturbation, aka the complete graph, you get a smoothly polynomial time. Uh, two years later, they improve the complexity to, nine, to n to the 9. Which is big, okay? Which is big, uh, and then that is the work of uh, lots of people. Here it is Ruta. Uh, I, th there are lots of contributions here. I keep uh, my favorite one. Uh, they define smooth analysis immune reductions, which is something that is very useful in complexity, like how I reduce a problem to another problem. And if I have smooth analysis to one, a positive smooth analysis to one of them, then I can transfer it to the other one. And they generalize it. Uh, they generalize the methodology to better response to coordinate games. And also something that there was in the stock of 2017, they saw that look, as long as we are using that technique for the structured case, the end to log n uh, is tight as analysis. And then we have uh, our results at stock 2020. So in the amazing summer before COVID. Okay, <laughs> we break the n to the log n to the n to the root log n, and we earn the first Twitter in my life. Uh, so Bubek was very happy about uh, that, and he published it in uh, in the discussion. I discovered this discussion today, by the way. Um, there was a discussion about oh, if you perturb more than one neuron, more than one uh, vertex, what is happening? And he said, look, I believe that the problem is uh, seems really harder. 
uh, and I don't know what is happening from k to k minus 1. So after solving that case and examining what we can do better or worse without, uh, with our analysis and without knowing that discussion, uh, we decide let's solve a problem that has no literature. Uh, and um, we have the smooth local k equals 2 that uh, we started like one year later. And after three years, we have a result. Um, I want to say something interesting. In a conference, I met uh, Noah Golovitz, he's a very good uh, friend and st uh, student of Kostis, and he told me, Kostis, tri uh, Kostis like, tried the problem with a, a, a mathematician uh, for one semester, but they said, okay, it takes too much time. And um, yeah, then I thought, okay, with me and Michalis and the rest of the group, it took uh, about three years. And uh, it came again back in my mind, the biggest lesson that I took from Michalis. Persistent, devotion, think and think and think again and again. Um, so, first of all, an open question. What is the smooth complexity of the local max cut even for the flip K1 for arbitrary graphs? We don't have lower bounds, so here is an open question. Now our results. Uh, in general, the analysis go first with probabilistic analysis. I saw, we saw that uh, we have um, a high probability result. With high probability, the algorithm runs in good amount of steps. And then you control the tail of the probability and you prove the expected value that it is a definition, the expected value of the time performance in order to show the case of the, um, the, the guarantee that you need for the definition of smooth analysis. So th this is the, f the result for the uh, flip one, the n to root log n. And uh, this is our uh, new results about the um, flip uh, two case. Uh, now, you see that it is n to uh, log uh, 10. And someone could say, wait, this is less than this. And they give you a more powerful algorithm. But the guarantee is also more ha is harder, OK? Now I have to give you a local optimum that it is robust over quadratic perturbations. Uh, and then, uh, except from uh, solving the problem of local max cut, actually, you can reduce in that problem lots of other problems, the direct case, the case of the network affiliation games, the stable neural net. This is the problem that uh, it is called the, the stabilization of Hopfield network, and uh, max to uh, sat. Now, for the rest uh, of the time, I will try just to give some ideas of what is happening. Uh, how, like, I will try to give some takeaways for people that they're inspired and they would like to work in the problem. So the, the main idea just for the two flips is as long as the single flips are the majority, we will work with them. Uh, if you have that the majority of the case in your sequence are the double flips, then we will work with them and we'll try to prove our bounds. For the flip one, you have just the step one, OK? So question one, uh, let's say that we are doing a flip. What is the contribution? Uh, the contribution is just that, like the, the edges that you are earning minus the edges that you are uh, missing from the flip. Question two, uh, OK, a very quick observation. Like just by uh, normalizing the constants, the, the, the weights can be between minus one and one. Uh, so given that at the worst case, you have the complete graph, the total amount of edges is n squared. So here is a very simple observation. If there was like a big promise that at every step that we are doing, we have epsilon, uh, at least epsilon contribution, then at most n squared over epsilon steps, we, uh, if that happens with very high probability, then uh, in this amount of uh, time, uh, I have complete the, the whole situation. Why? Because n squared is the, the total amount of the potential that I have. Like, this is the, the maximum weight that I can get, OK? So if the epsilon that I can guarantee with high probability is polynomial, then this number is polynomial. Uh, if epsilon is inverse quasi-polynomial, then this is a quasi-polynomial uh, algorithm. Uh, Another simple observation, actually what I would like to say is that, uh, OK, I don't request in my whole sequence to be uh, epsilon contributing at every step. Let's break other blocks of uh, size L. If uh, the blocks have a polynomial size and at every block I have at least one flip that was epsilon contributing, at least epsilon, uh, then 
in n squared times L over epsilon, if epsilon is quasi-polynomial and L is polynomial, I have a good algorithm. Excellent. So the question here is how much unlucky uh, can we be? Uh, so the question, is, the, the, the simplest question that I can give you is like take n consecutive flips uh, and uh, examine uh, what is the probability that um, all of them will be at most epsilon contributing. Uh, okay, so first of all, how bad uh, luck w we can have with one flip? It is easy, like you are asking what is a, a linear combination of random numbers uh, is between zero and epsilon, this is at most of uh, epsilon. Okay, so what is the, the probability now that uh, n flips uh, are at most epsilon? So if the flips were independent events, then this is easy, because, okay, the initial, the initial configurations of your problem are 2 to the n. Uh, this is like uh, the different uh, sequences that you can have, and you have a very nice union bound. So if you look here, if I choose epsilon to be 1 over poly n, I can make the probability uh, with high probability that uh, this bad event does not happen. So with high probability, I have an epsilon that it is inverse polynomial, so I have an algorithm that has smooth polynomial complexity. But uh, if I have uh, lots of flips, uh, the question is, are there really dependent events? So to give you just an example, imagine that uh, we're asking that. Uh, we have a flip and we earn just one edge, and then we have another flip and we earn another edge. Yeah, this is uh, epsilon squared. But if you have three flips now, that it is the first one n x1, the second one n x2, and the last one ask this event, then this is correlated event. So uh, the question here is how many linear independent improvements, improvement vectors I have? Uh, so the, all the question is about the rank. If the rank uh, of uh, this matrix that it is created by the improvement vectors is uh, small, like O1, in comparison with the length of the block, then uh, in order, okay, again, you can win the, the probability. You can, you, you can make it exponentially small, but you have to choose epsilon to be exponential large. So uh, then the guarantee is that the algorithm runs in exponential time and you are off. So the, the main challenge is how we can tackle the huge union bound and how, uh, how many independent flips you can have. The main thing that I would like to pass is it's all about the rank. So all the discussion in those two papers is let's find out combinatorial arguments that proves that uh, in this matrix uh, that is created by the improvements, I can do some uh, linear combinations that will create a large uh, lower triangular matrices, for example, with high rank. Okay? So uh, let me uh, refine it. We want to find blocks that uh, b blocks in the sequence that uh, they have really high rank in comparison with the, the length of the block, okay? So the developed machinery for that, in the flip one case, uh, there is the, the following idea from Ed Child and Rockling. So let's say that you have this sequence. That means U1 flip, then U4 flip, etc., etc. So I call an arc two consecutive appearances of the same node. So here is a very simple observation. Between two consecutive nodes, there exists at least one node that it is odd. The reason is the following. Imagine that I did that. I am U1, and now I pass to that side. If all the nodes that uh, passed in, in the middle passed even a number of times, when I go back, the configuration that I will see is the same. So I don't have strict improvement. That it is the, the main rule of the flip algorithm, okay? So what is now the improvement, what is the improvement of uh, an arc? Eh, it is very easy, like this is the improvement from the first flip. You have the, actually you keep only the odd nodes, the even nodes, you don't even observe that they are flipped. And you go back, you have the other gain. Now, here is something important. When you are trying to find the gain uh, that you get from the arc, that it is the summation of the two flips, uh, keeps only the nodes that appear inside. That it is very helpful because with that way you make smaller the union bound that you have to take. You, you don't need really to know what is the configuration over all the nodes. 
you need only to know the, uh, the configurations of the nodes that they were between the arc. Okay? So, uh, and the main lemma is, uh, the, the main lemma of uh, HL and Rockling is you can find always blocks that has a density of rank, one over uh, log n, that gives the n to log n. And now the major idea about uh, our first paper was the following. Okay, to make this uh, density higher, either you have to make the block smaller, uh, deleting nodes, that was a very novel thing that uh, we don't know any other result in uh, smooth analysis that did it. Uh, either you have to delete nodes somehow to explain why it doesn't matter some nodes in the block uh, of the improvement uh, sequence, uh, of the improving sequence, or you have to find more uh, independent arcs. Now, deleting nodes is a very nice idea. Why? Because imagine that you have a long arc and you have at the interior a node that flips 20 times. So the block seems to be large, but it is 20 times, it is even. So you, you can cut all of them. Even if it is 51, you can cut the 50 and keep it just one. Now, it is not so easy. Why? Because when you will say, okay, I want to delete all these uh, nodes, these nodes contribute to something else and contribute to something else. It's like a propagation event. So the, the question is, if we delete nodes, uh, the arcs in our analysis should preserve all the improvements uh, that we see. Otherwise, uh, we discuss about a different uh, analysis, a different exec execution of the problem. So the trade-off uh, give us, instead of n log n, n to uh, root of log n. Okay? And uh, the last thing that I would like to say about the flip two, uh, the case is much more uh, strange. Now you have the, um, uh, here are the, the two flips, like the U1 and U2 are the, the vertices that they are flipped. So we create what we call an auxiliary graph that says, okay, we will put down all the, all the nodes that uh, they, they moved. And what you are trying to do is something similar with the arc, but takes about 20 pages to explain it. <laughs> that, what, what, what do you need? You, you need to create something like cycles that, first of all, will have the following property. You will find a linear combination of them such that you will cancel out all the nodes that they are not participated, like inside the arcs, that the arcs matter only the nodes that they are uh, moving odd number of times inside the arc. So that, that is the idea. You want to create a cycle uh, inside this graph such that all the inactive nodes will, will be cancelled. And the main idea is that after uh, lots of uh, arguments, you can show that uh, the rank of the cycles, uh, the, the linear combinations that uh, you have found out that cancel the inactive nodes, have rank 1 over poly log n that gives the, uh, the result that we have. So to wrap up, this is the algorithm for the flip 2, flip 1, and this is the algorithm for the, uh, the result that we have from uh, flip 2. It is open to make it better. Uh, some open problems. Uh, can you find better smooth analysis uh, for this problem? What is the smooth analysis approximation ratio? So uh, the local, like the two-opt uh, TSP, that it is, I call it, it is two-opt. Uh, it is two-opt in the worst case. When you do the smooth analysis, the approximation ratio is better. So what is the case for the local max cut? How is going? I'm happy that they see the face of Daniel uh, with uh, excitement. <laughs> I want to, to confess it. So, um, also, can you provide lower bounds about the structure model? Can you show that because it is structure model and you do not perturb it so much, uh, you have a lower bound? This is also something like in the limit of the NP completeness or of the hardness. That look from this perspective of uh, perturbation, this is the limit. Here is when the problem is starting to be really hard. What is the case of the flip K? Uh, other problems that we're trying to tackle is what is happening with the max 3 sat for the local version. And uh, apply our analysis to different kinds of problems. Uh, I'm just one minute before the end. Uh, the last thing that I would like to say is the following. As I said at the beginning, I was working also in many other problems, but uh, it is amazing that in all these problems, somehow, Michalis was, uh, by the way, I would like to say also that I am 
uh, really grateful about the freedom that this advisor gave me. Like, he, he, he never complained that I'm collaborating with other people. They, they, we speak about some stuff that maybe in good universities with such good people uh, sounds obvious, but they are not. Uh, and I'm grateful about the whole freedom and convenience that he offered me. But intriguingly, <laughs> in any of these projects, Somehow, Michalis was again in the back of my mind. Like all the questions that I tried to answer uh, in all these problems were uh, friends of the main question, uh, were inspired from the main question that Michalis offered me in the PhD. Why simple arguments work so well in our uh, times? Uh, Michalis, happy birthday. Uh, I'm really uh, honored to be one of your students. Uh, Plutarchus said the following, the mind is not a vessel to be filled you know, with knowledge. Uh, should be a fire to be uh, candled. Uh, I'm thankful both from Michalis and uh, uh, Rocco uh, that you uh, flame this fire. Uh, this is a very rare um, how we, uh, how we call these pictures that we're taking uh, with our... Yeah, this is a very rare selfie photo of Michalis. Keep it if you want it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Right, right. Why do we think this most complexity has to impact this behavior? Uh, it's not always. Uh, like, uh, it's funny. I, I, I will defend your model, you know. <laughs> uh, okay, there are other models. Like, um, uh, in the case of CAS, for example, the algorithms that we are doing, the competitive ratio is uh, another way to explain what is happening in practice. But uh, in my opinion, smooth analysis has a very nice, uh, the, the, the most interesting, uh, the, the best answer that I have is from the cognitive example that I, I give. You need something that gives the idea of the structure and at the same time explains the imperfections that you see in the world. There is criticism. One of the criticisms is between the full, uh, the, the full uh, perturbation model and the structured one. Uh, but it is like a step to, to explain what is happening uh, in the practice. Also, like... Why the noise is uh, helpful? Okay, the, the, the first answer is... Uh, the, sorry, I, I, I will do my best, okay? Uh, the, the first answer that I have is the following, that, uh, uh, you know, you, you see a, a linear program and you say, okay, this linear program uh, has exponential time for a method that uh, at every other uh, situation, it runs really well. And then you're asking, is that the case, this, uh, uh, this polytope I will meet really in practice? And you change just a little bit uh, a corner, and there is a method that runs well. Uh, are we at the end of that story? So that, that is the idea of the perturbation. So that answers the, the following question, like that thing, I will never see it in practice. In other words, it has measure zero to, to see it in practice. The, it happens, but the, it has measure zero to, to see it in practice. Now, if I am honest, even for the simplex, we have not given the correct answer yet. Why? Uh, because the switching method, the pivoting rules that we are using, have not, uh, we have not uh, a smooth analysis uh, for them. In comparison, uh, the shadow vertex uh, uh, rule is not a rule that we are using in practice. So we are again at the beginning of that story. But uh, if I want to give a, a last answer, the last answer is the following. Uh, theory, uh, look outside ML world. ML world has transported a little bit uh, CS uh, in something like biology. You have an unknown box uh, and you are now sampling like 
uh, having it like ex you are doing just experiments to see what is happening. At least smooth analysis gives you the chance to, to, to speak a little bit uh, further than the worst case analysis that says that everything is hard and give you an opportunity to say, okay, here, uh, here is something that could happen in practice, like the imperfections of the world can interfere the model and uh, give you uh, better results. Like in the gradient descent framework, for example, that is the most honorary local search continuous optimization method, if you do uh, a perturbation, I'm finishing, yeah. Uh, if you do a perturbation, uh, the landscape that you get gives you a polynomial uh, conversion to a secondary stationary point. So it seems that at least explains our questions. In the next century, I hope that there will be someone else that will give another uh, model for the next uh, case, uh, for the next open problems that we will stack again. This is my answer. So I got to know Mahalis when I was a summer intern at Bell Labs for three summers. So Joan Feigenbaum brought me there the first summer, and then Mahalis was my supervisor the last summer. Um, I thought I should have a picture of us from those days to begin my talk, but then I remember those were the dark ages. We weren't carrying around cell phones in our pockets or looking at screens, and I don't have a picture. So I'll just tell you, there was more hair to go around. <laughs> and, um, they were the dark ages in other ways. It was right before web search. So I mean, I'm sure many of you are gonna, the younger people are, this means we couldn't look up papers, but it was worse than that. If you had a stupid, potentially embarrassing question, you could not Google that in the privacy of your own home. You had to ask some senior scholar like Mahalis. And he answered these incredibly graciously. So I wanna start with an example I've never forgotten. I was working on something, I don't remember what it was, I think it was with Nick Reingold, and during the process of working on this problem, I had proved that computing a maximum weight matching was NP complete. And um, I don't know, we were in one office, and I think Nick said, hey, let's ask Mahalis if this is known. And Mahalis is walking by, and he grabs him, and, and then Nick says, hey, Dan proved that computing a maximum weight matching in a general graph is NP complete. And Mahalis said, that's very interesting. <laughs> we said, why? He said, because you can solve it in polynomial time. <laughs> and I was like, oh, let me go find the mistake in my proof. And I just want to say, like, Mahalis just did this so elegantly. I retained my dignity. I didn't feel like a fool. I wasn't embarrassed. As you can tell, right? I never forgot it. Um, I'll tell you another story about Mahalis, but we'll save that for the end of my talk. So for di and now I want to tell you about balancing covariates and randomized controlled trials. None of these are words that I knew a few years ago, so I will assume you don't necessarily either. I will introduce you to them the same way I learned about them. I should mention this work comes from a paper with Chris Harshaw, who's now a postdoc at MIT, Frederick Savvy, who's a professor in political science at Yale, and Pang Zhang, who's an assistant professor at Rutgers. It's from this paper called Balancing Covariance in Randomized Experiments Using the Gram-Schmidt Walk. The Gram-Schmidt Walk is this amazing algorithm from this paper by Bonsaldo Dush, Garg, and Lovett. So like, even if you're not interested in discrepancy theory, I, I highly recommend looking at the algorithm. It's just, a, if you like beautiful algorithms, it's just worth seeing. Um, so here's how I got into randomized controlled trials. My colleague, Nicholas Christakis, was setting up a trial of maternal health interventions. They were trying to find ways to get women in rural villages to do things that would improve their pregnancies, like taking um, vitamins and supplements and doing other things. So they had 16 different interventions they were trying. That's a lot. They had 176 rural villages in a region of Honduras in which they're doing these studies. By the way, that's also a lot. Cost of the study is around $10 million. This means they need to divide those 176 villages, which I drew roughly here in latitude and longitude, into 16 different groups. Each group would have 11 villages. And here I gave a color to indicate like which group of village might belong to. And they were about a month before getting this study going. And Nicholas was becoming concerned because when he's 
he was discovering the law of small numbers. You know, when you choose a few things at random, you see patterns. Um, if you looked at some of the groups, like there would be a group that might all be on the western end of this region. And he was concerned that if the outcome for that treatment, the village getting the treatment was particularly good or particularly bad, he might not know if it was due to the treatment or due to something going on in that part of the country. Similarly, some group could be at a middle latitude. And again, he was not sure whether or not the results of the study would be due to that. And not only was he not sure, you know, there'd be referees who would complain and people doing meta-analyses later. And it was worse than this. As you can imagine, for a study of this magnitude, they had done a lot of research on these villages. They'd measured many things about them other than their location. So I learned the word covariate that day. Covariate is things you've measured about your subjects. Coordinates of a vector. Um, they measured, in particular more here, like the distance to a hospital. How long it would take to reach a hospital when it was raining. There were some serious problems with rain and rural roads. Demographic information, median income, age, percent, female, altitude. Altitude varies quite a bit in Honduras. They were doing social interventions. They cared about social network measures. And all of the, when you measure all of these things and you start making random divisions, you can look at some of them that don't divide so well. I said, could I help him with this? I was like, yeah, I've got you. We've worked on this in my field. We call this discrepancy theory. So one of the fundamental results of discrepancy theory is if you give me a bunch of vectors, we can divide them into two groups that are pretty similar. Um, how similar? Well, the way I feel like Spencer really phrases the problem is we can be much more similar than if you did it at random. So I felt pretty good about that. You know, we know there are good solutions to this problem. And then Nikhil Bansal actually gave us an algorithm for doing it. That was much later. And okay, that algorithm you couldn't use, but then people built on this algorithm and solved all sorts of other discrepancy problems. So we have polynomial time algorithms for dividing things into two groups. I mean, you still have to think about what you mean by similar. Let's say I have these eight points here. Maybe these are some villages. You want to divide them into two groups. Let's color them. So here I'll color two of them, like four light blue and four light green. And now their means are similar. And you may think, ah, that's pretty good. At least on average, each of these things is pretty similar. Uh, that's like sort of the results of what Spencer lets you do under L1 notion of similar, I mean, L infinity notion of similar. It's not entirely satisfying. I mean, if I were to rotate this picture 45 degrees, you'd really see like all these are in one line and all these are in one line. But OK, you can ask for more than just making means similar. Uh, if you wanted to take a look at the distribution more broadly of these villages, you could say take a look at second moments. So that really means like look at the, uh, the second moments, the moment of inertia. This is an ellipse you would have for two villages. And if you want to make those similar, that's Weaver's problem, which is equivalent to the Cadison Singer problem, which I solved with Marcus and Srivastav. So we knew that it is possible to divide the villages into two groups, not just so the means are similar, but so that second moments are similar. Um, actually, we don't still know that you can do both simultaneously means and second moments, but at least makes the distributions look pretty similar. But you know what? This we didn't have an algorithm for. We still don't, but I had a lot of code because I'd worked on this problem for a long time. So I had things I could run. So I figured, let's do this. Um, and I produced an assignment of villages into these 16 different groups that balanced everything beautifully, much better than anything they were looking at. And I was really happy about that. And I came back to Nicholas and said, OK, let's use this. And he said, but how do I know this assignment of villages to treatment groups isn't going to be somehow bad for my study, isn't going to skew the results? And you know, my first reaction was, who hurt you? Like, what algorithm have you used that makes you think my algorithm is going to somehow be worse for your study than whatever you were doing? Um, but then I realized he had a point. So. Randomization is necessary for trials like this. Your whole goal in trials is to say, it's unlikely the results I'm observing are due to chance. 
Eventually, you want to put confidence intervals around your estimates of how effective treatments are. That is a probabilistic statement. Randomness has to be in there. But also, randomness is your friend. So you, if you're trying to balance things, you can do it much better on average than you can in the worst case. So by doing things intelligently randomly, we can do better. Fundamentally, what I learned is this is not really an optimization problem. We were not really trying to come up with like, the most balanced assignment of villages to groups. Or you know, we want a distribution. OK, good to say we're trying to come up with the best distribution of assignments of villages to groups. But you're not going to try to optimize over distributions. So that's too big. So, but you know, realizing what the problem was didn't help that much. The study was starting in four months. I mean, sorry, in a month. So what did I do? I just generated a hundred different, sorry, around many thousand different assignments of villages to treatment groups, and then picked a hundred that were all very far from each other and very different, said, now please pick one of these at random. Um, that seemed like a decent solution at the time, but it did, there was no theory. OK, so now here's what I'm going to do. I want to give you a mathematical framework that will make all these concerns rigorous, help us you know, put some numbers on what's good and what's bad, and tell you about an algorithm, which is the Gram-Schmidt walk, or the Gram-Schmidt walk design. And the takeaway for now, the two key properties are one, it's a, wor it's a worst case guarantee. It's what we call being robust. When I say the algorithm is robust, it can never be much worse than if you just did things independently at random. Only a little bit worse could it ever possibly be. But at least that means what Nicholas was worried about can't happen. Whatever we're doing can't mess things up too much. And it can help a lot. It also gives very good balance, which we will observe, or we'll understand that as meaning. It is possible to get much better estimates of treatment effects if your covariates are helpful. So if your covariates, things you measured, actually are rel related to the outcomes, then you can get better estimates of treatment effects. And no matter how conspiratorially someone designed your covariates, we can't do make things much worse by balancing them. OK, now let's use a model. I'm going to work under the Nyman-Rubin model. It's often called the potential outcomes model for studying randomized experiments. And to simplify things, let's not have 16 groups. Let's have two groups. Think like a test group and a control group. And let's also assume we're going to make them approximately the same size. So for every subject, there's a probability one half they go in one group, one half they go in the other. So in this model, um, they talk about potential outcomes. Little a of i is what we observe if we assign subject i to group a. And little b of i is what we observe if we assign subject i to group b. And the challenge in all of this is you never observe both. Like a subject is assigned, say, treatment or control, or one treatment or another. But you can't go back in time and rewind and observe both. So you, you don't know what you don't see. We also assume in this model that the random assignment to treatment or control is the only source of randomness. You know, there are Bayesians who like other models where they want to assume these AIs and BIs are random somehow, but I don't want to count on that randomness. So I like this model. It's like the most conservative model in the field. Uh, the easiest one for a theoretical computer scientist to appreciate, I think. We, only, we don't assume the AI and BI are random. We just assume they're fixed, and we don't know them. So we don't know the potential outcomes. All of our randomness will come from the assignment. OK, then let me just mention three designs that are very common. The first I'm going to call uniform IID. Literally, for every single subject, you flip a coin, comes up heads, you put them in group A, comes up tails, you put them in group B. Now, some of us have an intuition that we, we need to interrogate and examine, and we'll do it in a minute. But some of us have this intuition that you might want to actually make the two groups the same size. So instead, just. I'll call it a balanced assignment. You just pick half the elements. They go in one group. Half goes in another. Another very common thing is designs based on matching. So what you do is you try to take your subjects and try to divide them into pairs that are similar. Imagine if these were my villages, I'd be trying to find villages that are nearby each other in coordinates, but also in everything else we measure. You divide them into pairs that are similar. You get a matching. And then for each pair, you flip a coin. And if it comes up heads, this one is in group A, that's in group B. If it comes up tails, you do it the other way around. Um, 
I should mention, like, this is a very popular thing. And there's a phenomenon I observed, and I'm not sure if I'm to be embarrassed about it or horrified by it. But this means there are a lot of people in experimental design who want to compute maximum similarity matchings. And uh, at least as of 10 years ago, they couldn't do it. Um, I mean, yeah, so what? There's a polynomial time algorithm. There was no code to download that would run, and they couldn't implement it. And there's a lot of papers in the experimental design literature saying, hey, we can't actually do this maximum thing. Let's use a greedy heuristic and see what happens. As I say, I don't know whether I should be embarrassed that we didn't give them the code. Okay, it is now like in the Boost Graph library, so they can do it, but, or you know, horrified that they were doing this. Okay, let's see what we want to measure. So again, we've got these two potential outcomes, A of I, B of I, we can't observe both. What I want to figure out is the average treatment effect, which I'll call tau. That's the average of what would happen if I assign subject I to group A minus what would happen if I assign subject I to group B. So if you think of a medical study, these things might be like the years you will live if, you know, you, the years extra you will live if you're assigned to treatment versus if you're in the control. Or if you're Subash, it's the extra years you'll teach or something. Um, this is what I'm going to think about measuring, the average treatment effect. There are other things you can measure. So... We're going to estimate it, but it's called a Horvitz-Thompson estimator, but it, we don't need the name. It's this obvious thing. We're going to literally estimate it. Oh, by the way, uh, estimates get hats over them, so that's another rule I learned in statistics. So, like, um, here, like, right now I'm Dan. Now I'm an estimate of Dan, okay? You'll remember. Um, okay. So we'll estimate it by the sum of the potential outcomes we observe for everyone in group A, and subtract off the sum of the outcomes we observe for everyone in group B, and there's a proper scaling term. It's 2 over n. And the Swerfitz-Thompson estimator is correct in expectation. It does the right thing. I would just want to mention this is not the same as the other thing you might think of doing, which is measuring the difference of the means between the two groups. I mean, the other natural thing is measure the average of the a, little ai for all i in group A and the little b of i for all b in group B. These are different. Um, I prefer Horvitz-Thompson because it is correct in expectation and difference of means is not necessarily. But if the two groups are the same size or approximately the same size, it's not going to make much difference. Okay, there are two things we're going to care about. Once we're right in expectation, what we really care about is, well, how much error do we have? So what is the chance that our estimator differs from tau by too much? Okay, that's the first thing I thought we care about. Really, we care about not just making that small, but we care about actually knowing that it's small after it is small. So after you run an experiment, you have to produce a confidence interval, which is an estimator of this. We're not going to get into confidence intervals. We're just going to talk about concentration bounds. You know, what's the chance our estimator differs too much? Um, okay, so now we need a formula for the error. This is probably the one important formula in the whole talk. Uh, you want to know how we're going to algebraicize this. So what I will do is instead of talking about groups, I will use an indicator vector for them. I'll call it z. z is 1 at a subject i if i is in group A, minus 1 if it's in group B. And then the error of our estimator, where I multiplied it by n, is the inner product of z with this funny vector, which is the sum of the potential outcomes. So it's the inner product of z with a vector we call mu. So we call it the potential outcome vector. But it is the sum component-wise of the potential outcomes in A and the potential outcomes in B. Um, I'm going to tell you that. I wrote a proof down there just because it violates some people's intuition. But let's not worry about the proof. We have a formula for the error. So now we can talk about how concentrated this is when we make an experimental design. So the first way you'll try to measure how concentrated this is is doing something like look at the mean squared error. Uh, what's the variance? You know, what is the expectation of the square of tau hat minus tau? If that's small, then we can use Chebyshev's inequality and say you're unlikely that you're too far off. Uh, beyond that, of course, we can look at higher order moments, which what we really do in this field is you look at sub-Gaussian concentration. You try to prove that your error term looks, is more concentrated than a Gaussian whose variance looks like this mean squared error. But we'll start out focusing on mean squared error, uh, in part because I can give you a nice formula for it. 
So okay, if we have a formula for tau hat, or minus tau, we, a formula for our error, we can get a formula for the mean squared error. What it looks like, if I do a little manipulation, you know, I just want the expectation of this squared. Uh, that's because, I should say, I, I assumed that each of these probabilities was going to be a half for any particular unit. Not necessarily independent. That means the expectation of z is zero, and I get this nice formula. In the end, the mean squared error looks like a quadratic form. What it is, is it looks like, I'll ignore the one at n squared, it looks like mu transpose z mu, where z is a matrix. It's the covariance matrix of the assignment vector. So you can understand that if you want, like, uh, it's the expectation of z, z transpose, that's the outer products, or the ijth entry is the expectation of z of i times z of j. But there's this matrix that depends on our design. And we now have a formula for the mean squared error in terms of that matrix. We control this matrix, but we don't control mu. Again, we don't know the potential outcomes, but we make the design. So if we want to make this small, if I want to guarantee this is always small, well, I can use this upper bound, the mu transpose z mu is at most the squared norm of mu times the operator norm of the matrix, matrix Z, or that is its largest eigenvalue, or largest singular value in this case, it's symmetric. So as I say, if we can know Z but we can't know mu, the best thing I can do is I can try to make this small. And that's what we will try to do. So we're going to, when I talk about how robust is a design, I will measure the robustness by the operator norm, or largest eigenvalue, of the covariance matrix of this thing, capital Z. And moreover, that's nice, because that does capture worst case error. Like, there is, there, there are always vectors out there, potential, potential outcomes, Z, mu. So that mu transpose Z mu is equal to this norm of mu squared times operator norm of Z. This can be tight. So if you care about worst case error, it makes a lot of sense to measure the operator norm of Z. Or sorry, worst case, what happens. Um, OK, now let's use that and look at what happens for at least two of the designs we contemplated so far. The first one, IID. Let's say I just assign every subject by a coin flip independently. In that case, the covariance of Z is the identity matrix. Its operator norm is 1. And the mean squared error is 1 and n squared times the norm of mu squared. And you know what? You can't do any better. OK, for every single covariance matrix of plus minus 1 random variables, the diagonal is 1, the operator norm is at least 1. OK, so if you only care about worst case, independent coin flips is the only thing you're going to do. But if you're willing to just be a little bit more relaxed in the worst case, if you're willing to give up a little bit in the worst case, you can get lower variance if you're willing to hope that, I don't know, your potential outcomes are somehow related to your covariance. OK, let's take a look at an example of that. Why might I want to choose my treatment groups to have the same size? Again, people often think, let's not do ID coin flips. Pick half of the subjects, put them in group A, half put them in group B. Well, that means I'm picking a random uniform Z vector such that it's plus or minus 1 and the sum of the entries is 0. We can talk, write down its covariance matrix. I wrote it down. It's like uh, n, my, n over n minus 1 times the identity minus some multiple the L1s vector. Uh, I guess small 1s matrix. I like this because this is like the... Laplacian of the complete graph. But, um, OK, then we can see what is the mean squared error we get. And let's compare it with the previous case. If I make my two groups of the same size, there's a leading term, which is a 1 over n minus 1 squared. Previously, for the ID design, we had 1 over n squared. So this is a little bit bigger. You can be, that's where you get a little bit worse. If I make the two groups of the same size, it can be a little bit worse. Because instead of 1 and n squared, I get 1 and n minus 1 squared. But the other term is better. The other term we have here, before we had the norm of mu squared, now what we do is we take the vector mu, we subtract off the mean. You subtract off the mean from every entry, and you take the norm of that squared. And that will be smaller than the norm of mu squared. And if the mean of mu is far, far from 0, this will be better. So this term improves. 
Okay, so, and this happens a lot. Like, there are a lot of people where they do experiments where, like, number of years you live. Um, all those numbers are positive. So if I have a vector of positive numbers and I subtract off the mean, I probably decrease the norm a fair amount. So this is one reason why you might want to make sure that your groups A and B have the same size, at least if you're doing it at random over IID designs. Um, I also want to mention something that's a little odd. You might think, OK, if I want to subtract off the mean, why don't I just compute the mean and subtract that off? But if you compute the mean, you're actually computing what you've observed. You're taking the AIs observed, and I'm estimating the mean of those, and the BIs observed, I estimate the mean of those, and there's going to be error in that. And this is actually subtracting off the mean just somehow implicitly in the design of all of the terms, whether or not you observed them. So this design gets you the effect of subtracting off the mean for free without computing, just by choosing a design. Okay, so now let's put covariates into the equation. So I've measured a bunch of things about my experimental subjects. I will um, call each of them a vector x, let's say x1 through xn, I'll have n subjects, we'll put them in d dimensions, I'll stick them in the columns of this matrix x. For me, the ideal case, let's begin by looking at the ideal case, is what if these covariates were completely predictive? Meaning everything I've measured just tells me how people are gonna do, whether they get treatment or control. So let's set mean that mu I actually can write. It's in the row span of this matrix X. If that's the case, that means there's some beta. I don't know what it is. I don't know mu, I don't know beta, but there is some beta. So that mu I can write as X transpose beta. Then I can rewrite my formula for mean squared error. And it looks like this. In the end, it looks like it's got the square norm of beta times the operator norm of this matrix X, Z, X transpose. So Z was the covariate this matrix of my plus or minus one assignments. X is this matrix that has the covariates in it. Having the word covariance and covariates makes life tricky. I'll try to pronounce them correctly. Uh, okay, but here's so what do we do? If I want to make my error small in this case, and I don't know beta, I don't know mu, I just try to make the operator norm of this matrix small. And this is what we'll call balance. So, oh, I missed the slide. Okay, I will call the operator norm of x, z, x transpose my balance term. And now, it turns out if you give me any design, we can characterize or upper bound your mean squared error in terms of our balance of robustness and the, mean, the measure of robustness and the measure of balance. So you give me any design, you can compute the covariance of z, you compute these operator norms, and here's what you will get. You will get the mean squared error of our estimator tau hat. Is it most, well, the, the minimum over all betas, we don't have to compute it, this is just a bound, but you write it as a minimum, of the measure of robustness, you can see, times the error of a linear fit you get when you take a look at the norm of mu minus x transpose beta. So this is how well were your, did your covariates predict something? plus our measure of balance times the squared norm of beta, plus some cross terms, Let me, let's ignore those. We can, I'll, I'll get rid of them later. Um, but this you can do for any design. And by the way, some of you may recognize this looks like ridge regression. Um, often you know, when they're doing regression, they, put a, they penalize the norm of the regression term, and that's what this corresponds to. Okay, so here you get the idea. You want to make both balance and robustness small. I want to make both of those operator norms small. Implicitly, there should be a trade-off between balance and robustness. So let's see how good that trade-off can be. Uh, robustness, I said, is always at least one. That is here. Uh, the balance term, OK, this is not a strict statement, but it's approximately true. The balance, in general, will be at least the squared Euclidean norms of your vectors. So there's some lower bound around the squared Euclidean norms that's around here, and you want a trade-off somewhere along the way. We'd like to figure out, I mean, I, we know you can't minimize both, so you gotta pick some point here, and you wanna know how well you can do. This is how we propose measuring how good an experimental design is. In part because it gives upper bounds and errors. And we can ask, how do matching designs do? This is nice, because when you choose a matching design, you take a bunch of subjects, you divide them into pairs. 
And so we get these edges. And then for each pair, you assign one to group A, one to group B. It means you get a little block in the covariance matrix. The blocks, the choices are independent, so it's a block matrix. Each of these has operator norm two, so the largest eigenvalue is two. We always know the operator norm is two. But what about the balance? Okay, if you're in two dimensions, your balance can be okay if you choose a maximum similarity matching. In more than two dimensions, your balance is bad. Um, in more than two dimensions, your balance grows as a function of n, like n to the mi one minus two over d. So I don't like that, uh, in part because I know you can make balance constant. But if you're using matchings, your balance grows. So th the way I try to explain this to people, I mean, I should say, you know, there's a problem. Statisticians in some fields are very used to measuring just working in two dimensions. They're used to measuring like two covariates, maybe age and weight, or age and gender. Maybe it's two and a half dimensions, age, weight, and gender. Um, but I say, look, on the first day of class, students pretty much all look the same. I mean, there are a few clusters, but there's a bunch of white guys in baseball hats and you can't tell them apart. Um, eventually, by the end of the semester, you get to know these people and you can figure out who they are. Uh, the more you know about people, the less similar they seem. The more covariates you measure, the less good matches you're going to have. Okay, so we want to get rid of matching. Here's what the gram schmidt walk design lets us do. It lets us make balance and robustness constant and gives us a very nice curve that we can choose any point on. So what we do is we can pick some point. We call it phi. It lives somewhere in 0, or 1. The balance is at most 1 over phi, and sorry, the robustness is at most 1 over phi, and the balance will be at most, well, maximum Euclidean norm of a vector divided by 1 minus phi. So we get a curve like this for trading off balance and robustness. Sorry, I thought that yes. z is greater than 1 and this is not phi. Oh, phi when phi is between 0 and 1, then this 1 over phi will be at least 1. Right, right, yes, right, that's fair. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so we get, it's, it's, but this is an almost tight upper bound. Um, I know you can't beat this by more than like four thirds as a multiplicative factor. I also suspect it's actually tight, but to prove that involves some, proving some integrality of some SDP things that I don't quite know how to do. Um, I could be wrong, maybe it's not tight. But certainly the, the tight, whether or not this is tight is an issue about integrality. When you relax, it could be a teeny bit better maybe. Okay, so we proved that upper bound. Um, it follows actually from an upper bound on the covariance matrix Z in the Lovner order. But what we do is more than that. We don't just get the variance. We actually get the higher moments in sub-Gaussian concentration. So we get, um, oh, sorry, that was the next slide. I should have said the first thing was the mean squared error fits in this ridge regression form that I gave before without the cross terms. Okay, so the cross terms that I had a few slides ago, that was you can, for any design, you can upper bound the mean squared error in terms of balance and robustness plus cross terms. For our design, there are no cross terms, so that's nice. Uh, and, oh, I should have also said, or I got confused in my order, let's just say one question you might have is, what should this fee parameter be? So you know, you're probably wondering, I tell you there's this trade-off. You can trade off balance and robustness. You might just say, ah, let's make it a half and make both things small, but uh, you know, people care about this mean squared error a lot. Right? I mean, this is the width of a confidence interval somewhere. So you can ask yourself, what should it be? And the fortunate answer is, okay, you've got to make a modeling assumption to give an answer for what it should be. But usually, it's really close to one. Meaning, usually, your best results are going to come when you're actually making it really, really robust. Which is a surprising accident, but let me give you the intuition for why. So here was upper bound on the mean squared error. And if I take a look at the terms, here's the one that has 1 over phi in it. It winds up being multiplied by this uh, error of a least squares fit. How well do, does a linear combination of the covariate vectors fit the potential outcome vector? And if I have some model where the number of covariates is fixed, but my subjects grows, which is how most models go. Like, you know, you run a study, you know what you're going to measure. You say, huh, is 100 subjects enough? If not, we'll try to get 200 subjects. Cost twice as much, but 
you know, you try it. Whatever you're doing, this is going to grow, should grow linearly with n under reasonable assumptions, whereas the other term doesn't depend on n. The other term has a 1 over 1 minus v times the norm of beta squared. That is like the best fit. So if you want to minimize this sum, and you assume n is growing and d is fixed, and you assume some sort of regularity, you'll wind up, this term will be getting big, you'll try to keep this as small as possible, so you'll make phi very close to 1. So what does this mean? This means that when you're doing these experiments, you'll be guaranteed that you, your errors, your standard deviations, can't be much worse than if you were doing an IID design. But it turns out, if the covariates were predictive, then actually you will get much, much better mean squared errors of your estimator. How much better? One way of putting it is if you happen to know all of the potential outcomes and factor them out through a linear regression. That's how well you're doing, but you don't have to do any linear regression, which is nice because if you actually do any sort of linear regression or machine learning magic on the outcomes that you've measured from experiments, you know, you can get better estimates, but you can get worse estimates. You can be fitting to noise. So in this case, we're just saying use the simplest estimate possible. Estimate arousal of the difference of the AIs minus the difference of the BIs. Keep the magic in the design. OK, and here is my slide where I was going to say, yes, and we also have sub-Gaussian tails. And the sub-Gaussian tails look like what you get if you have this variance, a Gaussian of this variance. OK, I should really tell you where this Gram-Schmidt walk algorithm comes from and why we use it. So it comes from this paper of Bansal, Adush, Garg, and Lovett. And sort of here's the guarantee of the paper. It says, you give me a bunch of vectors of norm at most 1. They choose a random z. So z will assign a sign of plus 1 or minus 1 to each of those vectors. And the operator norm of xz, x transpose is at most 40. Or really what they're looking at is they're looking at the signed sum of those vectors times the signs, and they want it to be very concentrated, and they proved it's a root 40 sub-Gaussian random vector. Yes? Yeah, I'll mention the random walk later. First, they really just wanted this. Um, by the way, the reason of why they wanted this is there was, they were trying to come up with an algorithm for this discrepancy problem called Bonacic's problem, which I don't know if I have time to explain. But there was an earlier paper of Dodushkar, Lovett, and Nikolov, which showed that if you want to come up with a polynomial time algorithm for Bonacic's problem, or randomized polynomial time algorithm, one way to do it is if you can make a distribution like this. So actually, like, I feel like I got very, very lucky here because they were trying to solve Bonacic's problem. I don't need an algorithm for Bonacic's problem. I need some distribution that when you sample does this, and they happen to make it. So they made this algorithm that produces this distribution. On the other hand, we were really unhappy with root 40 sub-Gaussian, because that is, multiplies confidence intervals by a factor of root 40. And if I do that, I will be kicked out of any public health office or anything like that. So we spent a lot of time trying to come up with a better algorithm, because we knew this one existed. And eventually, we realized, maybe instead of coming up with a better algorithm, can we make a tighter analysis of this one? Because, you know, they, were trying to come up with a they weren't trying to optimize 40. They just wanted a constant. So a substantial fraction of our paper is just turning this 40 into a 1. Um, and that's optimal. You can't do better. And that gets you very sharp results and nice size confidence intervals. OK, so what we do, how we use this gram schmidt walk algorithm, is we don't run it on the original input vectors. What we actually, because you know, there's that phi in there. So we actually make these special vectors. They're hybrids, each of an elementary unit vector in the original vector. So every per subject gets their own elementary unit vector. And we just stack them on top of each other. Because the input matrix, as opposed to the columns of x, is like root phi times the identity plus root 1 minus phi times columns of x. And then you run the Gram-Schmidt walk on that. And sort of balancing the identity means you can't be too much worse than an IID design. And balancing x means you balance the covariance. 
OK, we have to do some other things. We also randomly permute the order of the vectors. Like This is not necessary for their purposes, but it turns out to be very useful when we later want to produce confidence intervals. So, OK, I guess I should have said in the initial version of our paper, um, this was most of the paper. But it's gone through something like seven rounds of refereeing where they ask us to add theorem after theorem. And yeah, so there's central limit theorems now that take up much more space. But they're all about estimating confidence intervals. In fact, we need to permute the order. OK, I should tell you just a little bit about the algorithm for those who some of you have seen it, if you haven't. Right, we're trying to make this plus minus one vector. So we're trying to find some corner. Or did we, they're trying to get a distribution on corners of the hypercube. And the way they do it is they start at the origin in the middle of the hypercube. And then they pick a direction, like this direction, and they move at random, either as far as they can this way till it hits a face or that way till it hits a face. And there's a, they, they choose the probabilities of going one way or the other, so in expectation they stay where they started. Let's say they wind up here. At the next step, then they pick a direction and they go this way or that way as far as they can. In expectation, they always stay at the origin. The way they pick the direction is very speci special. That's where Graham Schmidt comes in. And I'm not going to have time to tell you about how that goes. But Graham Schmidt comes into the way they pick this direction. What's interesting is there, there are precursors of this. So I, I view the main precursor for, in our community as Beck Fiala. That was one of the first papers in discrepancy theory. Did something like this, but it didn't need any randomness. But it had some special directions. There's this really interesting paper of Deville and Thiel on something called the cube method. It's used in survey sampling. They are like somewhere between Beck Fiala and Graham Schmidt Walk. They do this, they take random steps. They don't know about Beck Fiala, or they didn't know about Beck Fiala, and I don't think the people who are at the Graham Schmidt Walk knew about their work. It's a completely independent literature. Um, it makes sense. It would have been hard for them to find, I don't know, Beck Fiala, which is some paper about integer making theorems. And you don't look at that if you're doing survey sampling. But this is used in the French census. There's code for it in SAS. So like, right, people use this algorithm when, this is for actually, they use it for sampling, picking a subpopulation to sample, to do a study on instead of a whole population. Um, you might ask, right, could we improve the Gram-Schmidt walk? And well, okay, so first I'll say, the trade-off is within some constant of optimal. I mean, I would like to get that constant right. I don't know how to really. Uh, I, but, but I think it's the lower bound we need. Um, you could also ask, like, can we improve the balance term? Um, even there's some like, pretty nice distributions, which you can't. If you make, if n gets really, really big, you can improve the balance term, and you have random inputs. Or like, if you make some really nice assumptions about your inputs, you might be able to improve the balance term. But in general, we don't know. Um, Pang Zhang proved that it's NP hard to improve this. This is building on work of, oh darn, Chari Karnuman, and I'm forgetting the th uh, third author on that paper. That's embarrassing. Anyway, um, so she proved that it, if you, there's some constant C for which it's NP hard to figure out if you can make the balance zero versus it being lower bounded by a constant. So that is going to be hard to improve too much. Um, it's at least computationally hard. OK, so let me tell you where I am now. What I really want to do with this problem is the online version. So when I started working on this problem, I was talking to people doing, like Nicholas Christakis, they were testing interventions. They knew all of their subjects in advance. They knew the villages. People who are doing studies of educational policy know the schools they're doing studies on. Um, people who are studying you know, things in learning, usually like they know the classes beforehand they're doing the study on. But in medical trials, that's not our situation. If you're trying to test a vaccine, someone comes into your office, and you have to pull out the vaccine or the placebo and give it to them. And as you can imagine, the way people do those studies is like much more primitive. They don't have that many algorithms. They basically, like if you look at the COVID studies, they measure um, some things like, is this person over 65, under 65, or infirm? And they have a different pseudo-random generator that was established for when the next person comes in, put them in one of these three categories, pull the result from the appropriate pseudo-random generator. 
Um, and that's sort of how they got balanced. OK, that's what I really want to work on. It's been about four years now. Um, OK, I think as of March, we finally have a target algorithm. And Grav back there who's working with me on analyzing it, I, I have some reason to be optimistic we may have an analysis technique. We'll see. I, I don't know. Well, I'm going to be optimistic. But OK, so this brings me to my last story about Mahala. So the, my last summer when I was at Bell Labs, um, I didn't really get anything done. Um, at the end of the summer, I had a meeting with Mahalas to go over what had happened. He said, well, what are you working on? Well, I was trying to make these error correcting codes that could be encoded and decoded in linear time. I knew codes I could decode in linear time. I didn't know codes I could encode and decode in linear time. And I had some ideas about how to do it. And I told them you know, what I'd tried. But I was a graduate student, so the idea that I'd spent a whole summer and produced nothing was pretty disappointing to me. Um, you know, now I just like laugh at that <laughs> naivete. But Mahalas told me, he said, you know, that's OK. You're working on a hard problem. And again, I, like, I, I really needed to hear that. I don't know if Mahalas knows that, but you know, because it, it wasn't clear to me that was OK at the time. Now, is it OK that I've been spending four years on this problem? I, I sure hope so. <laughs> But um, you know, working on hard problems takes a while. I guess we heard that in our earlier talk as well. It's important to remember it's not the end of the world. Um, you just have to be prepared for it. And I think like, for the right problems, it's worth it. So um, let's say, let me summarize. We heard a lot about Mahalas' technical innovations, but I think it's even more important to hear about like, what makes him a great person which is how he makes other people feel about themselves. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, uh, yes, so I'll address this question. Right, good, and I'll repeat it just for a camera. The question is like, not all the covariates are the same. You don't actually have to put them all in equal footing. You can scale them. So the covariates are just rows of this matrix, and if you have some covariates, you can multiply different ones through by a different constant. And then if you look at the guarantees, it'll get you different balance guarantees for each one. Um, and actually, we did that in his initial study, Nicholas Christakis' initial study as well, because like some of his covariates he didn't think were very important. So I could scale them. But yeah, you can do this, which is also useful. Because yeah, then you can measure more and more covariates that you think are less important and put them on different scales. But there's a whole deep area that's like very hot in econometrics right now, especially people thinking about how do you run a pilot study to figure out which covariates you care about and how should you weight them for future studies. Yes. Yeah, so I think the idea is you can do something reasonable right now, but the right formulation is not quite there. Uh, but I will also say, like, if you follow Chris Harshaw, you will probably see a result of that form soon, because that's something he's working on. Yes. So the question is like, what if you don't want to make subjects equally likely to go into treatment and control? Uh, there's a chapter in the paper about that. So actually, the really nice thing about the Gram-Schmidt walk is it translates immediately. You just don't have to start at the origin in that cube. So OK, it's a small chapter. You can start anywhere, and then you can get for any individual subject. You can, so you can actually set for each individual subject the probability to go into treatment and control, and then everything else works. It's just a little more complicated, so it's, it's somewhere in an appendix of the paper. Oh, Chris. Uh huh. Now you have Oh, it's a okay. So it's a good question. So the question is like, right, you don't actually want your confidence intervals to depend on these things that we don't know. 
So what you actually need to do when you're making confidence intervals, you actually need to look at the data that you get and then make some confidence intervals. Um, okay, so this is where one can prove you do need some extra assumptions. And most of what people do in that field is like in the realm. So we have two different versions of this in the paper. One is based on you prove essential limit theorem, which says that your estimator looks like it's sub-Gaussian or Gaussian, actually, with a certain variance. And then you have to estimate that variance. But you can estimate that variance from the data. Um, the only part that makes me uncomfortable about all of this is there is some sort of central limit theorem and asymptotic notions that are necessary in order to make that make sense. We do have a version that works with non-asymptotic probability, where, but our estimator of the variance is a little maybe over-conservative. On the other hand, I, at least I've been told, though I have not read them, their impossibility theorem saying you, don't, you have to choose between one of these, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure if there's a way around it yet. It's something I want to think about. You mean that the variation of the general limit theorem is something you don't like? Yeah. Um, so, I, well, I don't happen to like asymptotic. I don't happen to like n going to infinity. Um, I like to have my theorems where I can actually make concrete statements about finite n. But then there's a trade off between what sort of assumptions you're going to make. I mean, basically, you have to talk about there being no outliers some way. You know, it's really bad if there is some subject who you see who then, you know, if there's one subject whose values are way off. And then you have to decide, are you going to clip those down and then make a statement about clipped values? Um, will people understand that statement? Like, you know, if, if you're trying to make a statement about how many years people will live if you give them a treatment, but we're going to, we're not going to assume no one lives an extra 20 years, you know, maybe that's okay. But like if you said 100, probably OK, 20, who knows? You know, you have to, if you have to start estimating stranger quantities, it makes people less happy. It, it makes it harder to interpret the studies. Um, uh, um, it's not bad. So you can make a, <laughs> yeah, you can make, we have a section where we do like a Horvitz-Thompson style estimator of variance. Um, or sorry, it's a slight upper bound on the variance, let's say. But that's in the latest version that's online. I think somewhere I had a slide listing all of the versions. Oh, and I forgot this one. Sorry. Happy birthday, Mahalas. But <laughs> yeah, uh, the current version has variance estimators and confidence intervals and central limit theorems. And, but again, the, the more things in that flavor you want to get, you need some more assumptions. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Kusha, and uh, yeah, thank you, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. So we are going to switch gears here. So most of the talks have been about uh, algorithms and complexity, but as Kusha was saying, my background is in logic and formal methods, and the reason I'm here is actually a testament to the versatility and diversity of the work uh, that Mihalis has done. So I, I finished my PhD in 1991 and joined, you know, the famed Bell Labs, and these were the glory days of Bell Labs. And uh, uh, you know, I, I really want to thank Mihalis and express my gratitude because, you know, I learned how to do research while working with him. So for his mentorship, uh, thankfully I got to collaborate a lot with him. So I was just checking the BLP, and it shows. Uh, uh, 14 joint publications, mostly in 1990s. And also, as you know, we have been discussing over the last two years, there are so many people here from Bell Labs, and everyone uh, remembers those days fondly because it was such a wonderful place to be, uh, uh, you know, to collaborate with others, and, uh, and Mihalis was a manager in 1127 there. And so, you know, we all owe our gratitude for nurturing such a wonderful workplace. Uh, I also want to take this moment to, uh, you know, to pay tribute to my first manager when I joined Bell Labs, and it was David Johnson. And, uh, you know, uh, it, David was in math department, and, uh, uh, you know, just we, we all know that how a uh, nice a person Mihalis is and a brilliant scientist. And David shared the same characteristics. Uh, 
uh, and unfortunately he's uh, not with us anymore. Actually, the last time I met David was uh, 10 years ago when uh, uh, we had, uh, you know, a nice uh, celebration for uh, uh, Mihalis' uh, 60th birthday. Uh, so, uh, so my background is in logic and formal methods, and uh, uh, this is, but I thought this one topic uh, about reinforcement learning could be uh, a connector to, you know, people interested in algorithms. So we hear a lot of hype about reinforcement learning, you know, the, actually, if you watch this demonstration of how this mechanical arm solves a Rubik's Cube, that's pretty impressive, and it's trained using reinforcement learning. And the underlying model here is that you know, we, uh, we want to model the world as Markov decision process, but the big difference is that the agent doesn't know the model in advance, so it's learning it as it interacts with the world. So at any point in time, the world is in some state and the agent proposes an action, one of the possible actions, and then uh, the, the state gets updated and the agent gets some reward. And the goal of the learning algorithm is to compute a policy uh, that maximizes the cumulative reward. So when we hear about all these wonderful uh, uh, successes of reinforcement learning, one thing that they don't tell you about or is left implicit is that the success crucially depends on uh, how you associate these rewards. And that could make a difference between uh, you know, uh, training uh, well versus failing completely. right? And this is all called uh, reward engineering. And if you ask ChatGPT, which also uses uh, reinforcement learning, about uh, why is re writing reward functions hard in reinforcement learning? And it comes up with fairly good description. In particular, uh, I want to highlight that it says that the reward function must be designed to properly balance short-term rewards with long-term goals, which can be difficult to accurately predict. And this is not just a kind of a theoretical problem. Uh, it's, uh, you know, this, this is, uh, I hope, it, you know, this is kind of a, a video of a game that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, the, of an agent trained uh, during uh, reinforcement learning. And even though the goal here was not to hit the obstacles and collect these green colored rewards, uh, the, it uh, turns out to be a problem because, uh, uh, because of what's called reward hacking, reward misspecification, the, so the negative rewards associated with crashing get compensated over the long run by the positive rewards for hitting targets. Right? So if you want to use RL in settings where uh, safety critical settings and so on, where avoiding obstacles is crucial, uh, you know this whole ball game of uh, associating rewards may not be the right way to go, right? And uh, so this, also, this has been observed for, for a long time and it's called myopia in RL. So here is a simple uh, grid world like thing. So you would expect things will work well here, but actually here the action space is continuous and the uh, state space is also continuous. So that uh, introduces some difficulties. So the, what we want the agent to do is to starting from S0, uh, either visit S1 or S2 while avoiding O, and it does that very well. So the plot here are like of some standard algorithms. On x-axis, we have number of samples. Uh, even there, it takes like a few million samples to learn this correctly, and the y-axis is probability of learning. But if you change uh, the desired intent slightly, and you say that, oh, after visiting S1 or S3, uh, we want to go to a, uh, uh, S3, then things uh, start getting complicated. So actually, the, the, the reddish lines that you see here are the uh, kind of the off-the-shelf RL algorithms like DDPG who work pretty poorly. And this is because of myopia. So in the first step, the agent uh, actually finds it much easier to go to S2. But then from S2, there is no path to S3. So it kind of gets stuck, right? So this actually provides an opportunity to ex allow the user to express intent in using high-level logical specifications and uh, actually dating back to you know, my days in Bell Labs, you know, this uh, temporal logic has been, uh, uh, you know, has been the cornerstone of uh, how we specify properties of reactive systems, and actually Moshe is also here who did a lot of uh, foundational work in that. So in, uh, uh, 
temporal logic, you could specify uh, uh, the intent by something like always not collision, and eventually you get to goal one, and then you get eventually to goal two. And so here we are not associating rewards with states, and we are just expressing the objective of the agent. And uh, what we would want is you know design policies. Uh, with respect to that. And actually, uh, in Mihalis's uh, group in Bell Labs, uh, the, one of the uh, uh, kind of you know, success stories in the products was this model checker called SPIN. Uh, and many people sitting here, like including Kusha, and, uh, you know, have contributed to the development of SPIN and Mihalis himself. And the, uh, so it's, uh, it's a widely used uh, model checker where the requirements are specified in uh, temporal logic, and then these specifications get compiled into some kind of an automaton, and then the system tries to check that through all the executions of the model, the specification is satisfied. So, the, uh, so this, uh, in the last five years, so a lot of people said, okay, let's start using temporal logic for specifications, and kind of the, uh, if you look at lots of papers, the general strategy is you would write a specification, compile it into some kind of a monitor or automaton, and, uh, and then implicitly define this uh, product uh, MDP. So you have the plant and the monitor, and then run a kind of off-the-shelf RL algorithm on this product, right? And ideally, you would get a control policy, right? So it turns, so actually, you know, over the last couple of years, we have been looking at this problem a bit carefully and uh, try to understand the theory. And we found that, you know, many of these uh, approaches are buggy. And what I'm going to tell you about is, you know, some of the findings, right? And uh, in fact, yeah, this is, uh, uh, so kind of the technical results here are based on these two papers and independently in uh, Michael Littman's group, uh, uh, they also realize that actually there are, there are some issues with uh, learning with respect to LTL objectives. And the main thing is that the classical temporal logic specifies uh, uh, properties over infinite horizon. So when we say eventually goal, it means, uh, you know, at some time in T without uh, putting a bound on T that the state satisfying goal is reached, right? And this causes some problems. Uh, so, uh, so I, uh, I want to tell you about some technical results. So let's let's uh, uh, and these are actually quite simple, and I can you know it's these are not complicated uh, uh, results. Except it seems like people hadn't really studied this with a rigorous theoretical lens. Uh, so, so I need some definitions. So, so here is an example MDP, which has like four states. Uh, uh, in every state, you have actions to make things simple. Only in the left state, starting state, we have two actions, A or B. In any state, when you choose an action, you get a probability distribution. So in, in this example, and I'm going to use this example throughout, uh, in the left state, in the starting state, when you pick an action A, with probability P, you go to the top state, right? And if you pick the action B, you go to the right state with probability 1. And then in the right state, no matter which action you pick, with probability P prime, you go to the top state, right? So and MDPs look exactly something like this, right? So a policy is a mapping from sequence of states. I mean, I'm being uh, not super uh, uh, precise here. It could be from S cross A star, but doesn't really matter. But the policy suggests uh, an action based on the history. In this, uh, in this simple example, essentially, we have only two choices, pick A at the beginning or pick B at the beginning. And then the objective is specified, and we will see different ways of specifying objectives. It's given an infinite sequence of states, you get some reward or a real, a real valued uh, a, a reward for that execution. And then since it's probabilistic, once you fix a policy, you get a distribution over runs, and you can associate an expected reward uh, with a policy pi. And the goal of the optimization algorithm is to find the optimal policy. right? So if my specification is eventually goal, where the goal is this purple colored state, well, the intent is described pretty clearly. And uh, in this simple example, well, if uh, assuming P prime is positive, so when, when I'm at the right state, there's some probability of going to the top state, uh, uh, I would pick green, right? Because then with once I pick uh, the green, you know, if I pick the uh, action B at the beginning, I'll go to the right state and with probability one, I'll end up in the uh, purple. Uh, 
uh, except when p prime is zero. In that case, uh, you know, it, it, uh, I, I should be picking red. Okay, so that's pretty easy. Uh, and the, uh, so that's, if I knew the um, MDP in advance, if, if I knew all the transition probabilities, then uh, this problem has been studied actually dating back to 90s. And uh, the, uh, uh, the problem would be you're given a finite state MDP and a temporal logic formula, and you find the optimal policy, right? But it's actually not as easy as it may seem because of this uh, infinitary aspect of the specification. So if you think about uh, just reachability, then I think uh, I can just give you that as an exercise and you'll all come up with an algorithm uh, before the end of my talk. But if it's uh, something like infinitely often goal, you have to compose this policy. Like once you get to goal, you have to again reach goal. And when you have Boolean combinations of these, things start getting a bit interesting. So this uh, uh, actually is a good time for a detour. So a couple of weeks ago, I was actually at a, another, uh, uh, you know, a fest, actually that was in honor of my uh, friend uh, Tom Hensinger and Crystal Bayer, who uh, is actually works a lot on probabilistic verification, was giving a talk. And uh, on, she was giving a tutorial on probabilistic verification, and she told this anecdote. And I, now, you know, it's a good opportunity for me to uh, use that anecdote here. So she was at this uh, uh, a panelist at some theory winter school in Hebrew University, and the panelists were asked this question: Which classical paper has influenced you most? And her answer was this paper, uh, which Mihalis and uh, Costas Kurkubetis who was also you know, a friend of many of us and was at Bell Labs in the 90s, uh, wrote, it, it's called The Complexity of Probabilistic Verification. So you know, we, we have heard about lots of papers that Mihalis wrote in the last two days, but they were all about algorithms and complexity. This is more on the formal method side, uh, published in JSEM. So yesterday, I actually sent Crystal uh, an email saying that, oh, since she mentioned it, you know, did she want to give a quote that I can use here? And, this is what she said. So the paper is clearly a milestone in the research field probabilistic model checking. Most impressive for me were the algorithms for Markov chains and LTL, or N NBA stands for non-deterministic buchiatometer specifications. Uh, comparatively simple, but very tricky, and at first unbelievable that they are correct. And of course they are. So this is again, you know, this is a, a view of Mihalis from a completely uh, different community. And so the general idea of these policy synthesis algorithms is that uh, you have, uh, when, uh, if you are given an MDPM and a temporal logic formula, you translate it into some kind of uh, deterministic automaton, and you look at, construct the product. And the algorithm, which actually, you, you know, there are, uh, uh, dating back to Mihalis's work, uh, does some analysis of the strongly connected components in the transition graph. Right, and uh, uh, actually I don't have uh, time for a tutorial, but the, there are some beautiful results in this space where uh, you know, instead of using deterministic automata, you could actually use a, a, a mild form of non-determinism, and these are called limit deterministic good for MDP automata, which are much easier to construct than fully deterministic automata. And particularly for this policy synthesis, uh, the, you, know, the, you, you could work with those. And that has, uh, that, that, that's quite interesting. The other, uh, from the practical side, so there is this uh, uh, tool uh, called PRISM, which is a model checker for probabilistic systems. So SPIN was more for concurrent systems. Uh, this is a project at Oxford that's been going on for like now two decades, and that implements many of these algorithms. So with that background, now let's ask what happens if the transition probabilities of M are not known a priori, right? So that's the question I want to focus on. So this question now uh, brings, uh, you know, uh, takes us back to the, uh, you know, the world of reinforcement learning. And the natural way to start is discounted rewards, right? So this is again studied well, but let me give you a brief background on this. So if I want to go to the top state, so uh, if I want, uh, you know, if I told a machine learning person, they would say, okay, let's just associate a reward with the top state. And for simplicity, let's assume I'm associating zero with all the states and some po large positive reward X with the top state. Right? 
So a reward function maps states to reals has to be specified by user. And in addition, the algorithm needs a discount factor, gamma. And then the, uh, the, run, the reward of an infinite run is this uh, discounted sum, a reward at uh, S0, and then gamma times the reward of the rest, uh, you know, of the rest of the run, right? So at every step, uh, we are discounting by gamma. Gamma is some number between zero and one, right? It's a parameter. So uh, if we run this, then actually, and you do the li little bit of analysis, then the cost of the red policy is something like p times x, and the, uh, for the green policy, if uh, p prime is zero, then it's zero. Otherwise, it's about gamma to the power n times x where n is the expected number of steps to hit uh, the top state once you are in the right state, which is about one over p prime, right? Yeah. So there may be, uh, my, my calculation may be slightly off, but essentially the, the expressions look a bit like this, right? So uh, how do we compute this? So actually there is this general algorithm called value iteration, and many of you may have seen it, but just uh, kind of a reminder. Uh, so V of S is the optimal value uh, that one could expect at uh, in state S. And this algorithm, what it does is it sets V S to some arbitrary values, and then you can update them. And they're updated by uh, using this intermediate thing, which is the Q, what are called Q values. So in state S, if I used action A, what would be uh, you know, what would be my uh, cumulative reward, right? And Q of, we can update the Q of uh, Q values by saying that if I'm taking the action A in state S, what would be the probability distribution? And let's uh, uh, use the current estimates of V values in, in those successor states S prime, discount them by gamma and uh, uh, add the current reward, right? And this iteration algorithm converges. So of course the problem here is that we are explicitly referring to these transition probabilities, but the whole point is that we don't know what these probabilities are. So the Q learning algorithm, and that's kind of now the standard one used, can be used uh, in the case when we don't know the probabilities and we are just sampling. And uh, this is uh, roughly what the algorithm does. So it's kind of the value iteration for the case of unknown MDPs. So these Q values are set to some, you know, arbitrary values. And in fact, uh, you know, we, don't, we, we are learning the system. We don't have access to the, uh, to the MDP. So let's say the system is in the current state S. And depending on our current estimate of Q values, let's say A star is the best action locally, you know, best, just look, looking at the Q values. Then what we want to do is either apply A star or, but we also want to do some exploration, so we may want to choose the remaining actions with some uniform probability and uh, actually take that action and see what reward we get. And what this, and the, of course, the state of the environment would be actually updated. And you, by those observations, uh, we can update the Q values, and alpha here is the learning rate. So that's roughly the algorithm. If you haven't seen it, it's probably not the uh, right place to go into the details of it. But the main thing I want to point out is it's, it's a very simple algorithm, and it's obviously it's not making any reference to the uh, to the to the you know to the underlying transition probabilities, and it fits the RL model, right? And there is uh, the nice theorem about uh, the Q learning is that it has this PAC MDP guarantee, and we'll come back to this later. So let's just want to remind you of the definition of in, in our context. So what's a PAC MDP uh, guarantee that we want from these learning algorithms? So since uh, this algorithm uh, is estimating the world and computing estimates of the optimal policy, or you, know, at, you could stop it at any point and ask it, what's your current optimal policy? Now, of course, uh, we don't know the entire uh, system, so we can only hope that it gives, uh, an, uh, the answer is only approximately correct, so we allow some approximation factor. And also, there is some randomization going on, so we could also expect the uh, epsilon optimal policy to be computed only with high probabilities, right? And the PAC and DP guarantee is that there is some function which depends only on the number of states and the number of actions 
uh, of the underlying MDP and these parameters P and epsilon such that if you let the algorithm run for those many steps, you will get the correct answer, right? the approximate answer with high probability. And there is a celebrated result uh, by uh, Michael Kearns and Singh uh, in, from 2002, which shows that this Q learning algorithm uh, not only has the PAC uh, MDP guarantee, but in fact, this function is polynomial, right? So that's like, it's efficiently PAC learnable, right? This shows that the uh, computing policies with respect to discounted rewards is uh, efficiently PAC learnable. So uh, uh, one more bit of history is that in, in, in the rewards that I talked about, they're Markovian. You're associating uh, rewards with states. What if I want to say that you, uh, you, know, you first have to go to goal one and then to goal two, only then you get a reward. So there is an easy fix for that, but it has, you know, it was introduced only recently and these are called reward machines. This was work done by uh, Sheila uh, Michael Ruth at uh, Toronto and it's actually, it's very related to the uh, kind of the monitors that formal methods people use. So the idea here is that instead of associating rewards with the states of the world, I can write a monitor and in this case, you know, the monitor is saying first you have to go to goal one and then you go to goal two and when you do both, you get a reward X. So the, so the monitor is observing the state and updating the monitor state and the rewards are associated with the monitor state. And the, the Q learning algorithm can be generalized to this setting also, right? For reward machines. Okay, so the first question then we asked is, uh, can I translate temporal logic specifications to discounted rewards? So let's go back to our example. My specs is eventually goal. Offhand, I don't know any RL algorithm for it. I have this uh, RL algorithm for discounted rewards and also for reward machines, so can I do something with that, right? And our optimal policy was, if P prime is positive, then you know, it, I should be taking the green edge, otherwise pick the red. Uh, well, so the natural thing would be, can I associate some large X? But then we just did the analysis and this is, uh, this was what the, you know, for that discounted reward optimization problem, these were the, uh, you know, these were the, you know, the, the values of these different policies. And, you know, you can, uh, it's very easy to see that since I have to pick these uh, values X and the discount factor gamma before I have any estimate of P and P prime, I cannot, that's not possible. It's I, I cannot uh, choose X and gamma, which work for all P and P prime. Okay, so this particular translation doesn't work. So you could ask the question, or oh, maybe I should have associated negative rewards with other states. Maybe I can construct a reward machine which observes the history and then, uh, you know, then uses that, right? Yeah. So that also does, uh, it actually doesn't work that even if you allow infinite state reward machines, uh, you cannot uh, actually re reduce this problem to discounted rewards, right? And the intuitive difficulty here is that actually if, uh, the lot of, uh, uh, you know, when we start talking about these temporal logic specifications and if you, fic if you imagine what the analysis would look like if I knew uh, what P and P prime were, uh, so as I mentioned earlier, they amount to looking at the strongly connected components of the underlying state transition graph. But if some, uh, but if you didn't know which ones are zero and which ones are not, then the structure of these strongly connected components changes and that poses difficulties. And if we make an assumption that a priori, I, I know which P's are zero uh, and which are non-zero, then actually the impossibility results don't work. Right, yeah. Then, so the actual values are not important, but which ones are zero and non-zero are crucial, right? But we don't know that, right? Yeah. So one theorem that we proved was actually this uh, temporal logic specifications cannot be reduced to discounted rewards. And now, how do you formalize that? Well, you have to first uh, formalize the notion of reduction, and that's uh, so these MDPs. Uh, with unknown probabilities are basically like black boxes where you can, uh, you know, you propose an action and you get back uh, an updated state. So in that setting, if you're transforming uh, the MDP, what, what does that reduction mean? So that's uh, uh, kind of a little bit uh, uh, 
technical length, so I'm not going to talk about that. But that's uh, if someone wants to discuss that, I, I could discuss it later in the brief. So the next thing we tried was looking at limit average rewards. So, so limit average rewards is actually studied uh, in the machine le learning literature, a lot less popular than discounted rewards, but it's, it's a fairly intuitive notion. So what's a, what's a li limit average reward? So let's look at uh, an execution of length t, let's say you know, from S0 to ST, then uh, just uh, add up all the rewards and divide by t. Right? So the, this is kind of the average reward up to time t. And then I can take limit of this as t goes to infinity. Right? So, and it's actually good to just look at the example here. So if I associate reward one with the top state and zero with the rest, uh, what would be the, you know, uh, uh, what, uh, the limit average reward would be one only if I get to one. Right? And the, the, the transient behavior would be actually completely lost because the, you know, in the, uh, uh, if, if, if I, if I settle into a cycle, then the reward in that cycle will only matter in the limit average case. So for the discounted uh, reward case, actually the transient rewards matter more. Actually what you get in the first step is most important because the later things get discounted by factor gamma. In limit average case, uh, actually where you settle in, you know, the, uh, the stable behavior uh, in, in control, uh, that's what matters, right? So it's kind of the uh, dual. So this looks cool. And uh, if you do the analysis, the uh, optimal, uh, with, with this assignment of local rewards, the limit average reward, uh, the optimal policy is uh, uh, exactly the optimal policy that we want for eventually uh, that uh, purple state. Because if P prime is positive, then you would, uh, uh, you want the, uh, green action because eventually you will go get to uh, you know the top state doesn't matter how many steps it takes if that's where you go then you settle there and that's what's going to contribute to the final value right and if p prime is zero then you know then doing the or the greedy thing is best right yeah. so it seems like we have solved kind of solved the problem we were a bit uh, uh, excited that uh, uh, because there people have proposed these uh, learning algorithms for limit average rewards, they're actually not that uh, well known and indeed there seem to be some issues with those as, as I'll mention later. So the, uh, 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 so how do we do this in general? So how, how, if my spec just said eventually goal, so in this particular example, once I get to goal, I just stay there. Uh, so here actually, you know, I can construct this reward machine. So basically I need a one bit of memory because once I reach goal, I need to be giving like some reward at every step, uh, even if I hit goal just once. And I can do that by writing this monitor, which just uh, says that, okay, once you see goal, you go and you keep giving one. And then uh, now look at the product of that world and this monitor and run your limit average uh, uh, policy synthesis and it would be equivalent to a solving eventually goal, right? So, uh, so if my specification is always safe, uh, so this was eventually goal like reachability, the dual is stay within some safe set of states that can also be reduced to this limit average reward. But what about this always eventually goal? So this is, you know, this uh, infinitary thing, uh, which is also called Buki acceptance. And this is what, you know, a lot of uh, research in temporal logic is focused on, right? Uh, so can this be reduced, right? And you would, the first attempt would be, uh, okay, maybe, you know, I construct a two-state monitor. So every time I see goal, uh, I give, you know, I give a reward of one. If I, at some later point, if I see not G, you have to go back. And then the next time you see a G, you, uh, you give a reward of one. So will this, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, can, can I, uh, uh, is the problem of computing the optimal policy with respect to limit average rewards for this monitor, same as uh, finding the optimal policy for the temporal logic specification always eventually goal? And the answer is no. The proof is not, 
complicated, but it's not, I, I can't describe it in one or two minutes, so, but it's there in, the, in, in our work. Uh, just as an aside, uh, recently you know, there is a beautiful result, which uh, not, not by our group, but uh, shows that uh, actually there is a translation from temporal logic formulas to reward machines, but it's parameterized. So in addition to this specification, there is this parameter alpha and such that if you give me an MDP, I, I, I don't know how to estimate this threshold, but there is a threshold alpha star such that uh, for all values of alpha greater than alpha star, the, you know, the optimal policy for, uh, for, for the MDP with respect to the temporal logic formula will be same as limit average optimal policy uh, for the product of the MDP and this uh, automaton that we have constructed. So basically what it says uh, is that uh, uh, even though I can't have a generic reduction, I can tweak the reduction a bit and introduce some parameter and for high enough values of those parameters, the reduction would work, right? So that's, that could be one, one possible way. But, uh, but we still haven't solved our problem, which is that can I learn from temporal logic specifications? So, so just to recall, uh, we had these out-of-box algorithms for discounted rewards. We had out-of-box algorithms for limit average rewards. And those are kind of giving some local rewards and we have these global specifications. We tried to reduce uh, te the temporal logic formulas to those, uh, uh, to those RL problems for, with known solutions, and we failed. So we could then, you know, the next thing to do is obviously ask, can I design a learning algorithm directly, right? So maybe something new, something more complicated, more innovative, but, uh, uh, what we have now is actually the impossibility result, and it's, it turns out to be fairly simple, and I'll give you the proof in five minutes, uh, which is that you can't have, uh, there doesn't exist a PAC MDP learning algorithm, and for, forget efficiently learnable, there, it's not even learnable. Right? Uh, even, and this holds only uh, also for safety specifications, so for very simple formulas like always safe. So what's the proof? So. Uh, so here is, uh, uh, you know, so let's look at the following MDP, which is with this parameter delta. So, you know, for every delta we get one MDP. So in the starting state, so the purple states are uh, where we want to keep the uh, you know, the system in. So our spec says always stay within these purple states, right? So those are our safe states. And in the left, it's the same, yeah, it's the same. I mean, you know, similar, yeah. The, uh, the, uh, oh, we, we, uh, good question. I'll, I'll come to that later, yeah. Th this is, no, this is a, th it's a, th it's maybe, actually, I think we're, the, who, who was showing this gap between theory and practice today, right? So this is theory, and I'll, we'll come to practice in a few minutes. So this is a precise theorem which says, you know, that's your specification and I give you an, you know, can you design an RL algorithm to learn with respect to this? And the answer is no, it's impossible, right? It's, it's the, there's no, uh, that, that's, it, it's, a, it's a precise result. So the, uh, uh, so, and here is the proof. So the, uh, so you want to stay within these purple states and then you say that the, uh, uh, starting in the left state, if you take the A action, the red action, you stay there. Uh, if you take the green action, you go to the right state. In the right state, so it's similar to the one I was using, but in the right state with probability delta, doesn't matter what action you pick, with probability delta, you go to the top state, right? So, uh, so obviously, if you always want to stay within the safe states here, you should pick A. And even if you allow uh, 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 history-dependent properties, it doesn't make sense to pick B, for example, after waiting in the first state for 1,000 steps. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, all those are very similar. But furthermore, uh, if you think of any strategy of that form, which at some point takes B, that won't even be epsilon optimal, right? Because uh, as assuming delta is positive, doesn't matter what it is, it will eventually take you to an unsafe state. So let's look at a variation of this and I'm calling that M superscript delta, which says that at the beginning, uh, if you pick an A with probability delta, you become unsafe, 
right? And with, uh, if you pick a B, then you go to this other state, state where you stay there forever, right? So it's kind of a symmetric version, except, you know, the, in one case, uh, in the, from the left thing, you go, uh, with some probability, you become unsafe. In, in the other case, from the right state, you, with some probability, you become unsafe. So for this, uh, for the one on the right, the optimal strategy is choose B, right? And because the, actually, again, no matter which other strategy you think, it's not even going to be epsilon optimal, assuming delta is positive, right? Yeah. So uh, it's easy to see that, uh, so I'm, I'm making slight simplifications. So it's, it's the, the quantifier is not pure, you know, completely universal, but generally independent of delta and epsilon, no strategy is epsilon optimal in, for both of these machines, right? So let's look at a third machine where actually, you know, with uh, no matter what you do, you just stay there, right? So that's our machine, right? So now here is the proof that of the impossibility result. So let's assume you had an, uh, if, you, if you gave me a pack MDP algorithm, which you said that if you run it on your MDP, it's interacting with the world and it's, uh, uh, it, you know, after a certain number of steps with high probability, it will give you, uh, an optimal policy that's guaranteed to be epsilon approximation of the, you know, of the optimal, what would go wrong? Well, so you can, you can execute that algorithm on this, you know, the rightmost MDPM, and after and some number of steps, it will output only epsilon optimal strategies for M. But if you look at the run of that algorithm, it's indistinguishable from, from all these three, because, you know, you have, uh, uh, their state spaces are the same. So the policies look the same, right? You have three states, S1, S2, S3. The policies say that, okay, you know, given a history of S1, S2, S3, what's the next action? And uh, so the execution of the algorithm will be consistent with both, uh, uh, you know, the left one and the middle one. Uh, what that means, but we have already shown that the set of, uh, the, uh, the set of opt epsilon optimal strategies for the left and right is uh, the, you know, there is nothing in common. So that intersection is empty, which means what the algorithm outputs has to be non-optimal for one of them. Uh, make, uh, it's like a contradiction that such an algorithm existed. Okay, so going back to practice and actually Moshe's question, and this is actually how we started. And in fact, most of this work, what, what I showed you was more kind of the theory end, but. Uh, uh, we have been doing a lot of work, which typically gets published in ICML and NeurIPS, is uh, uh, focusing on how to exploit the structure of the specification and so on. So the question is, okay, how do you avoid obstacles? Well, in all of these settings, you specify uh, a finite horizon to begin with, right? You say, okay, you know, I'm going to run this algorithm for like a million steps, right? And then, the, so the moment you specify that number, that's saying that, okay, you want to achieve your goals within a million steps and all along you have to avoid obstacles. Well, theoretically, the problem is solvable because it's actually if you think about these, uh, writing some Bellman style equations, it's like, you know, the million is your base case and then you could compute the optimal policy for a million minus one and so on, right? So the, now the question is how to compute it efficiently and how to reduce the sample complexity, and that's, uh, you know, so, th so those are more uh, empirical, practical questions, right? And the, uh, so I have, uh, let me just take two minutes to give you a flavor of uh, what happened. So this is actually, you know, an example uh, language that we have implemented, but, you know, others have done similar things. So this is, so now we don't have like this infinitely often and so on, because, you know, anyway, you have a finite horizon. So this language had sequencing choice uh, eventually and avoid obstacles or you know, ensuring things like that. This uh, language is called spectral. Just briefly, how do you, what's the problem here? So now it's not like theoretical, but it's like how can I exploit the structure of this specification uh, and make learning better, uh, having specified this time horizon t. So if uh, if, if I have a specification like visit S1 or S2, then S3 while avoiding O, so basically you compile it into some kind of a task graph. And now the goal is to find a path from initial state to the final uh, state of this task graph. And the, way, the where this uh, 
Specifying in a temporal logic helps is that the specification here actually gives you some structure. So this gives a natural hierarchical uh, RL algorithm where at the high level you are doing planning. Should I go uh, uh, along the top path or along the bottom path? And if I decide to go along the top path, then uh, the policy to go from S0 to S1, that's learned using RL. And uh, when you uh, get to S1, uh, you, uh, you want to decide which way to go, and that's done using kind of A star algorithm, which is doing a planning in the high level graph, right? So, uh, and we have shown, uh, so the, actually the plots that I showed actually show that the performance of this compositional learning algorithm that we have is much better than these out of the box algorithms, right? Yeah. So the, actually this plot I showed, so that the blue line is the one that's, uh, uh, that's generated by our algorithm, right? And then, you know, recently we have also looked at multi-agent case. Again, you fix the uh, uh, horizon, you know, the bound on the horizon, and then you could have like interesting specifications where you have multiple agents and maybe the green car wants to cross the intersection before the black car. So things like that can be specified nicely in temporal logic. And now you want to learn a policy for each agent, but now you have multiple agents. So, you know, these concepts like epsilon, Nash equilibrium, and so on, or they become uh, useful. You could also uh, start asking questions like, you know, how do I, I, I want something that maximizes social welfare. So now in this multi-agent case, you know, all the problems are computationally hard. So we do some kind of heuristics to, try to solve these problems and uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's more empirical. There's some ongoing work which is actually uh, integrating it with uh, perception. So the, um, so actually at the pen in the robotics lab, we have this robotic kitchen and I, you, where, you know, you can, we are trying to train the robot to do various tasks and maybe, you know, the task is, uh, the spec says eventually boiling water while avoiding spilt water. So here, the concepts like boiling water and spilt water are actually not marked as regions of the state space. And these are, have to be trained as perception-based classifiers. And uh, so here, we were uh, actually integrating uh, planning with uh, learning of low-level policies. And now what we are trying to do is to integrate planning at the high level uh, uh, learning policies at the low level, but also learning the classifiers for the goals simultaneously. And you can, uh, uh, if you do all of that uh, in an integrated fashion, you can get computational benefits. I don't have to train these classifiers uh, in advance uh, for all the concepts that appear in the, uh, you know, are potentially part of the specifications, but learn only those improve accuracy of a classifier such as boiling water only as needed as you are doing plan. Right? Uh, so this, uh, this brings me to the end of my talk. So, uh, you know, so, I, so we have some good theoretical understanding for, you know, about limits of learnability and, uh, but yeah, actually a lot of work uh, has been more on uh, building tools and practical algorithms. And a few months ago, we gave a tutorial at AAAI, and those slides are uh, uh, on my web page. And the, I want to thank two students who did most of this work, uh, Kishore, who graduated this summer, and is actually now doing RL for finance at this uh, financial company. But uh, Suguman Bansal, who was actually a, a PhD student with Moshe, and she spent um, postdoc uh, for a couple of years at Penn doing this work, and she's now on faculty at Georgia Tech. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's all finite horizon. It's it's fixed horizon tasks. Yeah. Uh, but if by bounded you mean uh, bounded, but you don't know the bound. No, it's not that fixed. It's literally there is a yeah the user specifies the bound yeah right yeah it's basically the specification is uh, yeah it's it's a DAG and you well uh, by the time they run out of bat before they run out of battery and so on right they're doing short they're doing short horizon planning basically 
right? And then you, uh, yeah, so there, there is no thing like always avoid obstacles is not, it's not the thing, right? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so no, but I think those are those the practical problems that are quite different building, uh, you know, integrating the, you know, the, the visual classifier to detect what's a pedestrian with the control policy. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so this, this was really the classical temporal logic interpretation of always and or just eventually right yeah, eventually achieve a goal. That's a problem. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you, you can't uh, design an RL algorithm for that, right? Yeah. Or you can make some assumptions. For example, you could, uh, lo these, all these impossibility proofs assumed that uh, uh, you don't know which probabilities are zero and which are not zero. So actually in some of the uh, proofs, uh, so some of the papers in the literature where they claim, you know, they're doing learning with respect to temporal logic specifications, they assume that you know strongly connected components of the MDP. You don't know the probabilities, but you know, you know, which edges exist and which edges don't exist. Right, so that could be a potential problem. The other uh, kind of tweak could be, you know, that if, um, it's non-zero, it has to be at least 0 0.01, for example. If you know a low, lower bound on how low a probability could be. Yeah, so then, yeah, that could be a reasonable practical assumption, yeah. But I mean, I, well, in, uh, uh, I, I don't know, in practice, people don't use temporal logic anyway, right? I mean, in, in this particular setting, I think. Thank you very much for the introduction. And well, uh, Mihalis, congratulations. It's really great for me to be here and to see you almost looking the same as when I visited you in Bell Labs, I don't know, 30 years ago or so. Yeah, Very briefly I made a, and it was a short visit and you already got flowers on other slides and you got on the penultimate pen lecture, you got, um, something else colored, what was it? Um, um, not flowers, but now here you have a colored hypograph for you, yeah, instead of flowers. Um, well, I'm, I will speak about some practical applications of hypergraph uh, decomposition techniques. And so uh, I speak about three problems. Actually, I speak about the, these two problems and mainly about Boolean conjunctive queries. Why? Because these problems are all equivalent, so it's sufficient to speak about one. So what are these problems? The CSP problem, constraint satisfaction problem, Boolean conjunctive query evaluation, or also conjunctive query evaluation with a result, but for simplicity I will mostly speak about Boolean queries. And the homomorphism problem between structures. So you have two relational structures and you want to know whether there's a homomorphism from one to the other. So these are important problems in different areas. And what is interesting to see is that all these problems are hypergraph based. So I will illustrate that briefly. So here you have a combinatorial crossword puzzle. What is a combinatorial puzzle? It's a puzzle where all the potential solutions are already there. So you don't have to have world knowledge, but you have to have a combinatorial knowledge because you have to fill these fields with this. That's one horizontal, one vertical, etc., etc. You have to fill this. And that's also known to be MP-complete. Yeah, so, so, um, so that's an MP-complete problem. Why? Because we have cycles. So that's all, my talk is all about how to control cycles in hypergraph, okay? And hypergraphs. So a similar problem is, so, so sorry, what you see, can see here is that we have a kind of homomorphism in this constraint satisfaction problem. We, these could be in, interpreted as variables and we have to, to find letters that match this Structure. So this is a database relation, for instance, a relation, and we have to find to replace these variables by letters. But these letters should match, and they should cross match, of course, if there are two constraints. Okay. So you, you can see that this is actually a kind of a database problem. Uh, it's also a kind of homomorphism problem because you want to find a homomorphism for this, of, the, of this structure if this is a structure to, to these structures here. To this structure contains several relations. Here you have an explicit database problem, and actually we have a querying problem. So the query is, 
So here you have a university database enrolled. Some, some professor has been enrolled. Uh, some student has been enrolled. At some problem, professor teaches uh, some course. And here is a parent relation between students and their parents. And you want to know, is there any teacher having a child enrolled in his or her course? And then you can say, well, uh, there's a student enrolled in a course with a registration date. And a professor who teaches the same course, you see, see here you have the same variable, and, and with some assignment date. And you have a, a P is a parent of S. Okay? So here you can, this is a conjunctive query, and that's a Boolean conjunctive query. You, we don't have to compute the entire join, we just want to know whether this constraint is satisfied. If it's satisfied, it's a bad sign for the university, basically, yeah, and we have to do something about it. Okay, so now we can look at the hypergraph that this query describes, and again, here we have a cyclic hypergraph, SCR, uh, so the variables here in this query are the vertices, they are identified with the vertices of the hypergraph, and then we can draw the hypergraph here, so every atom, this is also called a logical, the query is written in a logical way here, rather than in SQL, uh, it's a logical atom, and all these atoms have to be true, and of course this has, there should be a homomorphism from this to the database. And in a homomorphism, this C value must coincide with this C value. You cannot replace C by different things here. Okay? So if you draw this, you get a hypergraph which is obviously cyclic. And I will explain, it will give you a very brief definition of what it is. But here, in this case, it's really obvious that this is a cyclic hypergraph. Now, what is if we ask another query? We ask, is there a parent of a student but not necessarily in the same course, so, okay? Not necessarily by the same teacher in the uh, same course. Co is there any, any teacher, uh, any professor in the university who has a student, his own child a student? That's the query, but not necessarily in the, in the same course. And here we have an acyclic, obviously acyclic hypergraph, so because now we, this C and C prime do not have to coincide, okay? And that's an acyclic query, okay? Now, an interesting thing, other application, so, which actually boils down to constraint satisfaction, is combinatorial auctions, because we, we have spoken a lot of times already here in this conference on auctions, about auctions. So what's a combinatorial auction? And this is Vickery who has defined this concept formally um, and, and done a lot of work about it. Uh, combinatorial auction is one where the bidders can bid on several items and they, can, and they say, I want all these items or none. Okay, and so they can, basically each bidder can have one or more hyper edges, and then they can attach a price tag to a hyper edge. And now what you want to know is uh, the, the winner determination, and that's actually nothing else than a weighted uh, setpacking problem. It was already known as weighted setpacking problem. Yeah? So that would be a winning bid probably. Yeah? So a winning bid, uh, you have to select mutually disjoint hyper edges that maximize the revenue or whatever some, some value. Okay, so interestingly, and this problem is not, if you look at this problem, it, it, it has a, the bit hypergraph is just this hypergraph. Every bit is an, is an hyper edge, basically. Yeah, and, and the items for sale are the vertices. This bit hypergraph, even if it has structure, doesn't give you much, even if it is acyclic, as we will see later, uh, we will define acyclicity, doesn't give you much, because you could have one bit for everything, and that would make the hypergraph acyclic, but it wouldn't destroy <laughs> the problem wouldn't be solved by this, yeah? because the, the, the sub-edges could be uh, the winning bits. Okay? But if we go, we transform this hypergraph to a dual hypergraph. Okay? So this hypergraph, sorry, is called the item hypergraph. The vertices are the items. Let me call it item hypergraph. And that's called the bit hypergraph, where the vertices are the bit, and every hyperedge is an item, which contains all the bits. This hypergraph and I will not show you how to do that. We have a paper about that can be transformed easily into a constraint satisfaction problem. Yeah? And so all the theory that I will present now yeah, of decompositions, etc., is also used, used, can be used for this dual hypergraph. Okay? Now, constraint satisfaction is, of, of course, well known to be MP complete, but here's just a very simple proof. You want to do graph col three colorability, and then you can express your graph as a query Okay, with the edges and variables in it, and then each edge must go to a right combination of colors. Okay, and so if you have this homomorphism from this structure to this structure, yeah, then the graph is three colorable, otherwise it's not. 
And the interesting thing here to see is that this is a very small database. It's a constant database, basically. Yeah? So that's why I show you this example. So the MP completeness even holds for binary relation and for constant databases. OK? Good. So what is an acyclic query? I mean, we have already seen this query as acyclic. What is an acyclic query? I will give you something as a definition which originally was not a definition, probably. Or maybe it was. Some people defined it like that. Other people had that as a consequence of a different definition. Doesn't matter. So an acyclic query is a query where you can divide the atoms, the query atoms. You can take the query atoms and make a tree out of it. And this tree is called joint tree. So what does the joint tree, what are the properties that this joint tree has to satisfy? So one, one property is that each atom must, must appear in this joint tree. Okay? And it's sufficient if each atom appears only once here. Okay? So the atoms can be organized as a tree. And we have to have the so-called connectedness condition. The connectedness condition says that, for instance, if, if I have a P here, uh, all the vertices that span a certain variable in the query, or uh, sorry, all, all the, so let's call this a bag, OK? All the bags that span a certain vertex, vertex in the query. So a vertex in the query or a query variable, here is P. This forms a connected subtree, OK? Here we have S and S. That forms a connected subtree. So what could not happen is that there is one variable here, the same variable here, but not here. Okay? So that wouldn't be a connected subtree. But I will come back to this. Okay? So that's the connectedness condition. And these, these are the two conditions for, for, for acyclicity of a query. So I gave you this definition here, but there are several other definitions, other equivalent definitions. Okay? Now, here are some other, some, two more examples. So here is an example of a query that is easily, whose uh, hyperquery, hypergraph actually, that is easily recognizable as acyclic because, you know, what kind of cycle can there be here? Yeah, okay. Cycles inside a single edge, of course, don't count. Yeah, we don't count that. Yeah, but, so, but here you have a query with a hypergraph it is not so trivial. So that shows you just, this is just to show you that this concept is not completely trivial. It's less trivial than graph cyclicity or, yeah, or acyclicity because this hypergraph is still acyclic even though it has a path. Yeah? If, if you say, if you take the primal graph where every two vertices are connected if they appear in the same hyperedge, you have a real cycle here in. Yeah? And still this cycle is in a certain sense controlled because it's in adjacent vertices and you can have even worse cases where a cycle is controlled because it's in a branch, etc. So um, that can happen. And this piece here of the, of the hypergraph can be transformed as follows in a joint tree. You take this big edge here. So that's this big edge here, a hyper edge. Okay? And then you have ABC, the cycle ABC. That's also a hyper edge here, ABC. Okay? And then you have CD here, and that works. Okay? So you can, this is just to show you the non triviality, not non complete triviality of this concept. Okay? Now, what are good properties of acyclic queries or acyclic hypergraphs? Let's, let me speak now about queries, but we also mean constraint satisfaction problems and problems related to combinatorial auctions and other hypergraph. Uh, based problems. So um, ACQs, acyclic queries can be recognized in linear time. So that's um, Mihalis, um, or as you say in the U US, Mahalis, yeah, as I learned, uh, has uh, shown that first in an unpublished paper. And then uh, in the talk that uh, Bob gave yesterday, Bob Tarjan gave yesterday, um, with, by techniques similar to, to, what, to what Bob presented. Uh, using um, spanning maximum weight spanning trees, uh, you can prove that, or uh, they could prove that uh, ACQs, acyclic conjunctive queries, can be recognized in linear time, or acyclic hypergraphs, more generally, can be recognized in linear time. Um, and also, joint trees can be, as an easy byproduct, can be computed in linear time. So if, you have a, if I give you a hypergraph, if I give you this hypergraph, Okay? It's not so easy for a human immediately to recognize that it is, it is acyclic, but the algorithm of Tajan and Yanakakis and an earlier algorithm also of, of Mihalis can prove, can generate this uh, at the rest. Yeah? 
uh, in linear time. So that's, there were other algorithms that could do it in quadratic time. They, they, looked, they were looking for a perfect elimination order between uh, hyper edges. And that's also what you produce because uh, every joint tree also I implicitly contains a kind of elimination order because you start, for instance, from the leaves and then work, work up uh, to the root and you eliminate one and the edge after the other uh, and prove that it is, this, this, this hypergraph is acyclic. But then another interesting, and that's, that's what I call Jan Yanakakis algorithm because the title of my talk was a little bit ambiguous, I have to say. It was Yanakakis algorithm. But Yanakakis <laughs> has designed many algorithms. So Yanakakis famous algorithms in database theory, I would say, and Yanakakis only by Yanakakis, yeah? not Tarjan and Yanakakis, that's the other famous algorithm, okay? So let me go back to that. Pardon? Given that the paper was unpublished, how do you know the existence of the paper? Because that period you didn't have a That's time. a good thing. I, a very good thing. I looked it up in, in some other papers by Michalis, and he cites it, I think, unpublished. He or other people cite, cite an unpublished paper. Unseen. I've never read the unpublished paper, but <laughs> I believe this citation. Yeah? So, I mean, it's from serious people. Yeah? Yeah, so maybe Michalis can tell. <laughs> 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 Okay. It's yeah, it's somewhere in your office. Uh, so, another good property is a Boolean acyclic query can be answered in polynomial time rather than being MP complete, as, as we have to see. A non acyclic query we have already seen can be MP hard. Yeah, but in general they are MP hard, but acyclic queries can be done in this time, so that's a very generous up the upper bound. I give a log, I have a log factor here for ordering uh, the relations, yeah? And because if you order the relations, then you can do the, some other operations easily if you first order them. But of course, if you have enough uh, hash fun, hashing or other indexes or whatever, then you don't need this log factor here, okay? And so that's this, I will come back to this algorithm. That's Yanakaki's algorithm. And uh, so, but the basic result is it's, poly, it's a low-level polynomial time. And um, we have, uh, with uh, my colleagues Leone and Scarcello, uh, we have pinpointed much later the exact complexity of this uh, algorithm, and it's actually complete for log, log CFL, this evaluation problem. Log CFL is a very low-level complexity class. It's in NC2, so that means basically the message is it's highly parallelizable. Okay, this problem is highly parallelizable. And also a non-Boolean query. So a query with a result, okay, that gives you a result where some of the variables should be output, the combinations, yeah, as tuples, um, can be answered with polynomial delay. That will also be very, very clear when I show you this algorithm. Now, Michalis didn't do only these papers, these papers. He was really engaged in, in, in early work on acyclic queries. So all these papers and many more yeah, he has written many more of these papers. And this, some, some together with uh, um, David Meyer, others with Jeff, who is here, and other papers, several with Jeff, I think, um, Papa Dimitriou. Yeah, so with many of you, yeah, Mihalis has written papers. Papa Dimitriou, <laughs> Christos doesn't remember this paper now, but yeah, <laughs> it's acyclic. yes, acyclic, yeah. So. At least it comes here, acyclic quiz. So, so I can just say, Mihalis has done really pioneering work. I mean, at the root of query processing. So how to evaluate? So how does Jan, uh, Yanakaki's algorithm work? Well, first you generate a, a joint tree, for example, by methods similar to what uh, Bob and, uh, has in the paper of Tajan and Yanakakis. Okay, or you, you, do, you use a quadratic algorithm and, and look for some, um, that there's the GYO reduction. Uh, there's a kind of reduction done by other authors, but it works in quadratic time, etc. So you can start to, to produce a joint tree. And then you use the proper Yanakakis algorithm to evaluate the query by semi-joints in two passes. I also have to say, originally this was all not about queries, proper queries, it was about database schemes. 
but it's completely equivalent because database schemes were also conceived as queries because you have to do a join over the entire database scheme and generate, generate a kind of um, um, uh, universal relation from it or whatever. So it's nowadays, it's, I think queries are more, this is more inter interesting to apply it to queries. Okay. So you have a joint tree. And now for each atom in the query, you have a relation. Okay, that's the relation here. And you have to match this to this, this to this, this to this, this to this. Now, what does the algorithm do? It starts with the leaves, for example, and it makes a kind of semi-join. So I had actually a semi-join sign, yeah, which is different. It is on the slides, but PowerPoint transformed it to scissors. But scissors are very good. It's a very good symbol, actually. So I, I, I say, okay, leave it. Yeah, scissors are good, yeah, because they express what we are doing here. We are cutting off tuples. We are cutting off tuples here. So how do we do this? We are, so here we, we cut off tuples, so we reduce this relation. We reduce this relation by this relation. So that's called a semi-joint reduction. And what do we do here? We eliminate all those tuples here that don't match down, down okay, to the right-hand side. Okay? So for instance, this tuple here, so where do they have to match? They have to match this tuple, the middle, the middle value of this tuple must coincide with at least one right value of this tuple. So this z must coincide with this z, but there is no nine here, so that tuple can go away, and, and, and similarly for other tuples, okay? Now we do the same thing here, okay? We reduce the result of the first reduction by this, and then we reduce the result of this reduction, of, of this two, this, we reduce this, and then we are done. And this, if some tuples are left here, what happens? They can, they can expand completely for the entire tree. You can now go down with this tuple. For instance, you can take this 3, 7, and it will, it's guaranteed to match at least one here because we, we, we eliminated those which don't match. This is guaranteed to match one here and to match one here. And, and putting these tuples together, we get an answer to the query. Yeah, so that's a very smart, it's a simple algorithm, but very smart. It has two passes, yeah, and what it produces is a very interesting. So if we do that for all the tuples here, and we go down again, so we reduce it down. So we, now we eliminate also the tuples that are here, that, are, that cannot contribute, okay? If we have done this, so we have a pass up and a pass down, afterwards we get a fully reduced uh, database here in this case, if we consider this, this relations as a database. This is a fully reduced database, Everything matches with everything. Every element here uh, contributes to a solution tuple in the query, but also it's a very smart representation of the query because the result can actually be exponential, can be highly exponential. The number ex exponent is the number of relations actually. Yeah, so in this case it would be four. Yeah, you can construct relations that are polynomial, but where the result is highly exponential. But in this form, kept in this form, it is always polynomial, and you have all, you can easily check for does there exist a tuple where y is equals to three? Yes, it exists because yeah, you just look whether there's some y which is three, etc. So you have all results in a very compact form uh, in this fully reduced uh, database. Okay? Pardon? Yes, so the several counting problems can be easily solved easily with this, not all. So one has to test, there are studies, what can you do, what, what you can find minimum solutions, but not everything. So there, and, yeah, most, most, most counting problems are easier or easy with this, okay? So how to generalize, so, so we were fascinated by that work, actually, and we, but we, saw, we, we looked at, at real situations, and we say, well, many queries are actually acyclic, yeah? So, so it would be nice to generalize it a little bit more because we notice that many queries, queries are some, in some kind of, of, of almost acyclic, but not really acyclic, yeah? So we wanted to find something that is equivalent to, uh, that is similar to Trevis, but for hypergraphs. Now, Trevis exists for hypergraphs, and actually in the Original paper by Robertson and Seymour, who defined Trivis, uh, they defined it in the original paper for hypergraphs and not just for graphs, and you will see that. So we started to say, well, how to generalize hypergraph acyclicity? Hypergraph acyclicity is something different from graph acyclicity, as we have seen. Yeah? It's more complex. 
So we were looking for generalizations and we were looking, so what are good properties of generalizations? So one is, of course, we want to really generalize acyclicity. So queries with width k greater or equal 1 should contain all acyclic queries. Okay, so that's an important property here. Yeah? We want to gener really generalize it. Secondly, we want tractable recognizability. Yeah? That just was uh, Tajan and Yanakakis algorithm does for uh, acyclic queries. We want to do it for the generalization too. We want to be able to have an algorithm that recognizes whether this query has cyclicity degree 4 or whatever. Okay? At least for fixed, for fixed number, for fixed k. Yeah, we want to, so we want to find a certain width of a query, just like tree width, but hyper tree width, we call it hyper tree width. A width, and for this width, uh, uh, acyclicity should be rec recognized, uh, uh, queries of this width should be recognized efficiently. And then we want, of course, tractable query answering. That's clear. That's the main goal that we aim at, tractable queries. Yeah? So these are the three, pro three good properties that we want to achieve. So here you have a query to illustrate this, what we want to do. You have a query and you have a hypergraph yeah, of the query. It's not completely trivial how to disentangle this hypergraph. Okay? So we wanted to have an automated method for finding this, for disentangling this hypergraph and getting something like this, which is much more structured. So we want to structure this hypergraph here, or this query here, into a kind of joint tree. So as you see, this is a different tree already, yeah? where then the query can be answered in a smarter way, similar to Yanakaki's algorithm. Okay? Now here you see tree decomposition. So that's the tree decomposition of the hypergraph, and that also works in some sense. Yeah? The tree decomposition works. So we, 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 we just take here, we don't take the edges, we just take the vertices or the variables of the query, and we put them into bags, Okay, such that each uh, hyper edge or each atom is covered. Okay, each atom must be covered, and then there must be the connectedness condition. So, for instance, if I take the variable x prime, x prime is here, x prime is here, x prime is here, but x prime is also in between. So it spans it spans a, a connected subtree. Yeah, all the all the bags. So these are called bags usually. These bags where a certain variable appears, span a, contact, a connected subtree, and that's true for every other variable. So if you take y prime, it goes down there. It, there's no, no, uh, no bag in between that doesn't contain y prime. Okay? So this would be a decomposition of tree with 8. That doesn't sound very nice because we want very low width, because in general, when we answer queries, the width is in the exponent. The width is constant. But 8 is a bad number, you have to agree with. Yeah, for, for, for such a, even if the query looks ugly, 8 is still a, a bad number because it's, it can lead to huge joints, etc. Okay? So what is the good thing about, about uh, tree decompositions? Optimal tree decompositions of fixed weeks with k can be computed efficiently, relatively efficiently, and they are very good. What was the definition of the, tree the previous bit? The definition of the tree bit? Of a hypergraph. Oh, the number eight you want, yeah. The definition of the eight is the maximum size of, of a bag minus one. Minus one because we have in, in edges in graphs, so it comes from graphs, yeah. Maximum size of a bag, and we are the minimum, pop for, for the minimum over all the compositions, okay? Good. So, trivies can be computed efficiently. Uh, query of bound, queries of bounded trivies can be evaluated efficiently, and here we have, this has been, proven by two, for two different concepts of tree width, actually, because you could also take the tree width of um, the incidence graph. You could always represent the hypergraph as an incidence graph where you have the vertices and the edges and hyper edges, and then you, you have a bipartite graph, and then you could consider the tree width of this. But for, for both, in both cases, yeah, and also in this, in, independently in the, C, in the AI constraint satisfaction literature, you find similar algorithms by Freude and, and Dechter, etc. Okay. So this is known. Queries of bounded trees can be evaluated uh, efficiently, but in some sense, the tree width is in the exponent. Okay? And 8, as, we, as I said, is bad. Yeah? So let's see if we can do a little bit better than tree width. But there's another problem with tree width, 
Another problem with Trivis is it doesn't generalize, generalize X acyclicity. Okay? Take, for instance, this query QN that consists of a single huge hyperedge. If we define the Trivis based on the primal graph, we have a big click here among all these variables. Yeah? And so the Trivis is not, is not bounded, whereas this is a trivially acyclic query. Okay? But the Trivis is the big click. If we define it in a similar construction, a little bit more involved, if we have the bipartite graph, you can do the similar thing, that you get the complete bipartite graph if you just add some n variables here, new variables for, for each one, then you get a, a very bad bipartite graph. So whatever graph you take, yeah, whatever measure of trivies you take, it doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't generalize acyclicity. Why? I can also tell you why. I can give you an intuition why. Acyclicity is not downwards monotonic. If you eliminate an edge, yeah, an, an acyclic graph can become cyclic because you can have a cycle that is covered by an entire edge. Yeah, that's acyclic then. Okay, I eliminate this edge and suddenly the graph becomes, the hypergraph becomes cyclic. Yeah? For no concept of, of tree width, this is true. For all concepts of tree width, if I eliminate edges, or, or, yeah, I, I still get a low tree width. Okay? So this is the, the, the deeper reason why these, these notions are actually different. Okay? Why we, we need here a different notion. We need a different notion if we want to capture this. Okay? So now we came up with a concept that we maybe unfortunately called generalized hyper tree decompositions. It's the same graph. So here you have a tree decomposition, but the tree decomposition is covered, as you see, by these atoms. And then rather than counting the variables, we just count the maximum number of atoms that we need in such a decomposition for covering. Now, the covering is also important. So, so, so what is a hyper tree decomposition, a generalized hyper tree decomposition? You just, the variables taken all together for each bag are a tree decomposition. So you have the, um, every, every, every hyper edge here must be covered fully by at least one bag, okay? So this, this hyper edge, for instance, S, Y, Y prime, et cetera, is covered here by this bag, if you take all the variables of this, et cetera, okay? And you have, must have the connectedness condition, which is already there because I said this must form a tree decomposition. So basically it's tree decomposition plus covering, okay? But there's one important difference. We can also use some Hyperedges or, or atoms, which I identify, yeah, atoms or hyperedges, and miss some, we can miss, we can take subsets basically. So, why is that necessary? Why is that useful? Because sometimes, you know, I want to have an F here, and if I just had the F here, then I would, I need, for example, the F here, because the F is here, I cannot use the F lower, but then, I still need to decompose the rest of this hypergraph. And here I have some x prime. And if I didn't have this partial edge here, x prime, y prime, and here I have some y prime, I would violate the connectedness condition. Okay? So I need them yeah, to, to make space to, to verify the connectedness condition. Okay? So and that's what creates computational problems, because now I have subsets of edges. And if my edges don't have constant size, which are not bounded by a constant number, then I have to to consider many, many sub-edges, basically. Okay, but this works. So, unfortunately, it's hard to compute. The reason is that we have to compute these sub-edges here, and simply they are not, yeah, uh, we can prove that even for hypertrivies, even for, for, for with two, the problem checking whether, general, whether a query has general hypertry decomposition two is MP complete, and for every other constant larger than two, two. So, However, we, if we slightly restrict general, this notion of generalized hypertree decomposition by using a special condition, then we get to the proper hypertree decompositions. So what, sorry, what is the special condition? Yes? Is it uh, NPR even if uh, the RT is bounded? Uh, say, is it, uh, you require like large RT? No. Uh, it's, um, if the arity is bounded, then we have uh, the, the exact hyperdivide decomposition is also a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
can be approximated, but it's, so that yeah. Say, yeah. Complexity is, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is the special condition? The special condition is if we leave out some variables here. So you see, these variables are actually not there. I replace them by underscores, which means I, I don't use them. I want to forget about them. Then these variables should not appear in the subtree of this node. They should not reappear. Okay. Yeah. So that means that somewhere else, of course, I need the full atom. And here I have the full atom here because every full atom needs to be covered. Okay, so that's hypertreated compositions. And this actually tells us, gives us a hint intuitively, which variables we should take out, those that never have to reappear. Yeah? So it's, it's a little bit strange. So we get components here. If, if, we, if we take this as a separator, this separator will produce components, and then we, we, we make sure uh, that these components tell us which variables we can leave out, and, and so we can compute this, actually. It's a, but it's still a restricted concept. So how to evaluate? So let me first say how to evaluate acyclic queries because that's. So I, I want to say now a few pro positive properties of 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 of, of low hypertrees of bounded hypertree with queries. Okay. Now what is? Um, what? Let me start with. The following that uh, we can answer such queries in polynomial time because that's so easy. That's the e really easy part. Okay. So imagine we have now here a hypertree decomposition of this query of width two. So the width is now the, the width. That's also important. Is now the number of the maximum number of atoms and no longer variables. Yeah. Of width two. So sorry. Here we have this is a hypertree decomposition of width two. Okay maximum number of, of atoms. So if we have such a hybrid decomposition of with 2, for instance, of this is a simpler query, how can we transform that to an acyclic query? Extremely simple. We take this, we take a bag that has more than one atom. Each, for each bag with more than one atom, here there's only one. We do the following. We compute the join between these, the corresponding relations. So here we have a relation G and the relation T. So we compute G join T. So we put these relations together. That's polynomial. Okay, that's quadratic in this case. Okay, so we have, the, we have it here. And then we form a new atom, G T of X, Y, Z. Rather than having G of X, Y and T of Y, Z, we have G T of X, Y, Z. Okay? Because anyway, these two need to be anyway. They, they need to be joined in the query anyway, because the query is a huge joint query, basically. Yeah? So they need to be joined anyway. So why not joining them in the bags? And given that I have a constant number of, of, of atoms in each bag, yeah, k, hypertree with k, yeah, the uh, maximum complexity here is uh, this time k times the query size, let's say. Yeah. Um, k is in the exponent, basically, here. Okay? So this would be quadratic. But if I had 3, it would be cubic, etc. So k is in the exponent. But if k is small, that's fine. Yeah? Not too bad. Okay, so that's a very, very simple trick. And so what are the good properties of uh, CQs and CSPs with bounded hypertree with? They generally, they, f first of all, they generalize acyclicity. So if a query is acyclic, that just means that the hypertree is or the generalized hypertree and the generalized hypertree and or the generalized hypertree have with one. Yeah, okay, an acyclic query, just... Um, they also generalize tree width in the sense that the generalized hypertree width is usually could be smaller than the hypertree width, and it's it's always smaller than the tree width. It's also easy to prove. It's not completely easy, but it's relatively easy to prove. Okay, so you get a smaller width. So in that case, in the case that the example that I just showed you, we went from eight to two. So that's a big gain. Yeah. Now for fixed k. Deciding whether the hypertree of a query is smaller or equal k or is equal to k is or the same a similar problem is in polynomial time and actually it has two k in the exponent. Okay, so it's getting that's an open problem whether that can be improved or not. Yeah, that's an open problem. So we, we don't know if this if this exponent can be improved. And 
It's log CFL complete again. It, it's, it's a problem, sorry, it's a problem in log CFL and therefore also in NC2. I don't know if that helps a lot now. People don't look at NC2 too much now, nowadays, but still, yeah, it could be done maybe with um, yeah, some Spark or, or some other infrastructure. Computing K hyper decompositions is feasible within the same bound here. So, so we can con compute concrete hyper a concrete hyper decomposition. Answering Boolean queries now have an exponent K again, yeah, here, but in the hyper width, which is lower than the tree width. Okay. And non-Boolean queries can be answered with polynomial delay. That's very easy to see. If, we, if, you, if you imagine back the Yanakakis tree, uh, Yanakakis algorithm, now we, we just start from one element and we backtrack and produce with each backtracking step, we will produce one solution in this tree because everything matches. And so based on this tree, we, we can now also compute the full answer, be it exponential or not, of this query, yeah? but with just polynomial delay. Okay. So uh, we also have a game characterization of Robert Marshall's, uh, of, of hyper compositions, uh, of a hypergraph. Uh, it's, you know there's a game characterization of um, um, Trevis, which is the robbers and cops game, the robber and cops game. One robber and cops sit on vertices and if the cops can trap the robber, if K cops can trap the robber, the, hyper, the, the, the width is, I think, K minus one, was, uh, K, I forgot, uh, this plus or minus one. Okay, so we have a similar game, but it's now called the Robbers and, sorry, the Robbers and Marshall game. Where is that? A robber, and, a robber and K Marshalls play the game on a hypergraph, and the Marshalls have to ca capture the robber, and the robber tries to elude the capture by running arbitrarily fast on the vertices along the edges of the hypergraph. So they can only run along edges, and where the marshals sit, they cannot run over those edges where the marshals sit. Okay? And the marshals approach by helicopter, and between two moves of the marshals, that's a very important point, the joint, um, the intersection of, 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 of the vertices that the marshals occupy remain blocked. Okay, so that's a little bit related to the special condition that we have. So let me just show you that game. So here you have a robber and sitting happily on, on, some, on two edges here on the hypergraph. And now we have two marshals and the marshals, of course, approach and try to get, yeah, to divide the hypergraph. Yeah. Why does the robber look like Papa Dimitri? <laughs> yes, you say that, I didn't say that. <laughs> Papa, sorry, Papa Dimitri has two eyes. He doesn't have a bat on one eye. <laughs> this is the difference, so. <laughs> so, now the marshals go like this, and now this is blocked, and this marshal can easily kill, uh, basically capture, capture, we don't want to kill anybody here, capture the robber. But the robber could also have fled to this, this uh, hyper edge, and of course then it's also easy, then both can jump there, yeah, and, 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 and trap, trap the robber. Okay, and this game um, is very useful in analyzing and comparing uh, hyper hypergraph decompositions, hyper, uh, tree decompositions to other types of decompositions that have, are maybe characterized by other games. So uh, the theorem is H has a hyper tree with smaller or equal K if, if and only if K marshals have a winning strategy on this hypergraph to capture the robber, okay? And H is acyclic if only, if that's a, just a corollary, is acyclic if one marshal has a winning strategy, okay? So how do hypertribuies and generalized hypertribuies relate? And we use this game actually to prove that basically there, it's a three approximation, constant factor three approximation. So the general hypertribuies the hypertribuis is smaller equals three times the general hypertribuis plus one. So I think that's a nice result because bounded hypertribuis means bounded generalized hypertribuis. Yeah? And of course we have to pay maybe, but not that much for it. Yeah? But we have a polynomial algorithm to get hypertribuis, whereas generalized is MP complete. And that we used heavily these Robert Marshall's games. We, have, we had to add more 
hyper edges, more marshals basically to get to, uh, to the generalized hypertrivies. Okay? In practice, hypertrivies and generalized hypertrivies, for practical queries, they don't differ that much also. Yeah? Good. Can we go beyond hypertrees? Um, oh, I'm already over time. Yeah. Can we go beyond, beyond hypertrees? So let me say, people have tried to do other notions, like fractional hypertrees, which is very interesting, and I want to explain very shortly. And submodular width, I will not explain it, because even query answering is, is exponential. So yeah, we submodular, but fractional is a very nice concept. So what does it mean? So recall that what we wanted is that coming from this representation to this one, it should be polynomial. And here we use simply the, the fixed number of atoms yeah, that make joints. Yeah? We have a fixed number of joints that we have to make for a bag with multiple, uh, with multiple atoms in order to get such a, to, to, to produce a single, single atom here with a re, uh, respective relation. Now there are other tricks. So there are some tricks where we have more atoms that still give a polynomial result, and, but the result can still be computed in polynomial time. And that are fractional edge covers. So let me show you here, this is a fractional edge cover. A fractional edge cover is every edge gets a, a number between 0 and 1. Okay? And we want, that, we want to have that um, every vertex is covered by at least 1. Yeah? And the minimum cover here is, is 1.5. The minimum number that we get, if, if we add the, the weight of each edge, let's say, is 1.5 here. So we say this hypergraph has fractional edge cover 1.5. Okay? Now, a very interesting result is, so first of all, for each query, an optimal fractional edge cover can be uh, minimum. This is rho star of q, can be computed in polynomial time via a linear program. So you can use a linear program to compute this fractional edge cover. Okay? So we can compute this, the best, the optimal, yeah? optimal number such that we give values to this hyper edge such that every vertex is, has at least um, one. Okay? And now it comes the interesting theorem. The answer to a query of fractional edge cover of weight row star q is at, at most of size size of the maximum relation time row, uh, to the row star of q. So the edge cover is now, yeah, is now in the exponent rather than the join. Okay? So what would that mean? So for these edges, that means that I can, I can solve this query um, rather than what we would do is we would do these, these joints and they would at least require quadratic time, this choice. That's a minimum. So because if we join two relations, well, the third relation is already contained. The, the attributes are, or the variables are already contained. So the third relation would not be a real join. It would just reduce the relation. Okay? So how can we do that? How is that possible? Yeah, that we make such a join and we only spend in the exponent 1.5 instead of 2. So it's not quadratic. It's less than quadratic, whereas the, the, the joining two, already two relations would be quadratic. And I will just show you this, um, how that's possible. So we want to compute this join. Okay, so if we compute any two of these, the other one is, the third one is simple because all the variables are already there, so that's a kind of semi-join that we have to apply. Okay, but the join itself of two relations is quadratic. So how can we do that? We take this relation, so that cannot be done with any join program. So we have to do something very smart here. We take a relation, we, we divide this relation into R plus and R minus. So we take any of this relation and, and we divide it into R plus. R plus are all those uh, values of x that have more than square root of n, uh, if n is, for instance, the size of the largest relation, yeah, that have more of, uh, than square root of n, or n is the, si the size of this relation, let's say. More than square root of n, corresponding y's. Okay? So these are tuples rich, rich values because they are in relation with many y's, more than square root of n. And then r minus has are those points which have uh, those axes which, which are, uh, have less than square root of n corresponding y's. Okay? Now we are doing the join for these different things and, and then we unite it because they, they are disjoint here so we can easily do the join here, the join here, and then we just unite the results. We just make a union of the results. 
So what, what is the join here? Here we have at most square root of nx values, of course, okay? Because you know, if, if, if n is the size of this relation, we have at most square root, uh, square root of nx values. And each of these x values can only have n, can only be expanded then by n of these values y and z, okay, in this join. Okay, so we get n to the 3 half, okay? This is times n, square root of n times n, okay? And here, instead of joining with this relation, we join with that relation. Uh, so, so sorry, here we, we, we reverse the relation. So sorry, here we have xc. So what was here is comes here. And here we have only square root, uh, here every, every element that we expand here from this one has only square root of n. And again, we have n square root of n and we have uh, n to the uh, three third, and then we put them together. And since they are disjoint, we get this result, okay? So now, this is a new, new technique, and of course, fractional cover with, is incomparable with hypertrivis, but we can modify hypertrivis, and instead of saying we, we want to have k um, atoms here, or k relations that we are joining, we say we, we, want, we can have an arbitrary number of relations, but we want that the uh, fractional edge cover, the fractional cover of, of these relations, of this hypergraph formed by them, is smaller than k. And th that means that the result is also the resulting relation that if we join them will also be smaller and there are techniques for this, okay? Now the only problem is that, so they have all the good properties, but the only problem is that fractional hypertrophy with K for fixed K is MP hard, even for K equals two is MP hard uh, to find. And what we have been working recently on is to find many good properties for which this is like bounded intersection property bounded multi intersection if I have intersect three edges or three disjoint edges uh, bound, bounded Wapnik Chervonenki's dimension etc and then we get tractability or approximation results but I can't speak about them thank you very much for your attention so I will uh, my talk to today will overlap with what Georg talked who was super talked uh, earlier in the in the workshop I will try to introduce the concept you may have not heard before, logical algorithmics. But first I'd like to tell you an old joke by Jeff Ullman. I came to Stanford as a postdoc in September 81. At that point he had been at Stanford for about two years. He came from Princeton. And tried to make conversation. I said, how do you compare Stanford to Princeton? And he said, well, the students here are not as good. And then he said, even the Greek students are not as good. <laughs> it took me a while to realize that his training set was Papa Dimitri Yanakakis. <laughs> so this was my introduction to Michalis before I even met him. And here is a lovely picture from 93, so this is 30 years ago. And here is the young Vardy. And where is Michalis? Here is the young Michalis. This was in Elonda in Crete. Okay, let's get down to business. Can you go back to take the photo? What? What? Photo of the photo. I'll send you the photo. No, here you get low quality. So let me very quick introduction to logic. So m modern mathematical logic can be kind of traced to uh, the 19th, 18th, 19th century where people tried to develop foundation for mathematics. The foundation issue come up. And in 1879, uh, Frege published a book called The Griff Schrieb, Language for Concept, where he asked the question, what is the language of mathematics? And the answer that he gave is what we call today first order logic. The term came later, only in 20th century. But he said, but every mathematical discourse is about mathematical objects, perhaps numbers, relationship between them, predicates, operations on them, functions, a, a Boolean operation. This is a little bit after Bull. Bull is around. Bull's book came up in 1849. So this is after Bull. And quantifier emerged just around that time. Okay, Peirce and Peano introduced the quantifier that exists and for all. So now we get 
we are, what are these, these are, we get formalism. What is formalism about? It's about mathematical structure. That concept took a while to emerge. It emerged in the 20th century. Mathematical structure consists of a domain, a set of relations, the predicates, the relationships, and functions. This is a mathematical uh, uh, structure, and every mathematical discourse is essentially about some mathematical structure. And we'll take two simple examples, a graph. We have nodes and edges. And now we can say something such as, for all x, there exists y such a u of x, y. And he said, this is a sync-free graph. Every node has, has an outgoing edge. Or we can have a group, which is, again, a set of elements and one binary, binary uh, operation. And now we can say, for example, for all x, for all y, x times y equal y times x. It says this uh, group is abelian. Now, when you teach logic, when you open a textbook in logic, you come into this a bit of a nuisance. These things make assertion about the structure. But if you look at the syntactical construction, you have to have formulas. Formulas have three variables. So look, let's look at the following formula. It says exists y and z, such y different than z, and there is an edge from x to y, and there is an edge from x to z. X is floating here. We didn't say what is X. We call it X is free. So you cannot ask, is this sentence, is this formula true in a graph or not? Because what is X? It's asking you, you know, is X equal to? Well, it depends on your assignment to X. So the only way to make sense of such a formula is to say, let's have an assignment to the three variables, and then we can talk whether it's true or not. Let's take X to be a particular node in the graph, then you can say, is, does it, does, is it the case it has two distinct, distinct nodes? Now, you can quantify over x. You can say every node has at least two distinct neighbors. Now, you made a fully uh, self-contained assertion about the graph. It is a true or not. And really, if you open a text, classical textbook in logic, maybe Enderton, and you will see that, that these formulas are kind of syntactic nuisance on the way to the promised land of sentences. I'm exaggerating a little bit, but not too much. We'll come to see why this is an important distinction. So a sentence is either true or not in a mathematical structure. So the sort of models of a, of a, of a sentence a size, is all the, let's say, graph that satisfy that sentence. And studying this class of, of a structure that are, that are described by, by sentence and logic, this is what's called model theory. So model theory is the meta-mathematic meta of mathematical modeling. Now, Ted Code in 1970 pointed out that formula can be viewed as queries. For example, the, the, the formula we saw before that says X has these two distinct variables, you can think of it as a query. It says, give me all the nodes that have at least two distinct neighbors. More formally, phi of G will be all the variable assignment to the variables, take alpha assignment, alpha of X1 to alpha of XK, such as G satisfies phi of x1 to, F, F, uh, to xk relative to the assignment alpha. So this is a, a very important uh, point of view that this syntactical nuisance that we had to form sentences is really now a very important object. So in that sense, if you are familiar with SQL, every SQL is really a formula. People usually don't ask questions about the database, is it true or false? <laughs> Only in examples in, 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 in classrooms we ask, you know, is it the case that there is a student taking class from, 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 from his parent. In reality, we ask, give me all the students that are taking class from their parents. Now, Ted Code also introduced a, a second important idea, again, which was an observation that's almost seemed kind of trivial, which is the tables and relation are the same thing. A relation is a set of, set of tuples, and a table is a set of rows. It's the same thing. Okay. But this, this uh, insight was the, found, the beginning of people within, within a few years, people actually building relational databases. And today, uh, if relational databases, if somebody waves a one and relational databases all fail, then Western civilization is going to collapse. And, and I think code justifiably got within, within just about a decade the Turing Award. But a thing that emerges from, from, from relational databases is this very intimate connection with logic and algorithm. And this is what I call logical algorithmic. That's the idea that I think is hidden there, and I'm trying to expose it here. 
But let's, before going to that, let's go to a little one step further. So you may hear about the unchangeable problem, the decision problem, it's undecidable. What is this undecidable result about? It's given a sentence first order logic. Is it always true? Or dually is it sometimes true? Okay? The, the, sentence, the, the formulas of the sentences are always true. These are the eternal truth in some sense. And that's during, and church and during, this is undecidable. Now, Code has asked a much simpler question. Okay? He says, we can call it model checking. Given a first order formula, and a finite structure, let's say a graph, and an assignment, does the graph satisfy the, the formula under this assignment? Now, for finite, for finite graph, the answer is, it is trivial. Every, every quantifier exists X, just try all the Xs for all Y, try all the Ys, and so it is trivially decidable. So logicians kind of are unimpressed, of course. Nobody wrote it down. It's a trivial observation, they claim. But this gave us the, the, the foundation for relational databases. So what is logical algorithmics? So typically, how we do algorithms, OK? You take a, uh, the book we used to call AHU, OHO, AHO, Hopkoff, Ullman. There is a property, and then you sit down, and you do an algorithm for that property. You say, perfect matching. So Edmond design algorithm for perfect matching. The logical perspective is, don't design a special algorithm for this, for the problem. Specify the problem formally. Describe what is the property if you, in a logic L. And then what you need is a, a query evaluation algorithm, which I call a meta-algorithm for that logic. For example, we have relational databases provide for us a uniform algorithm to evaluate all first-order queries. The SQL compiler and execution engine is a uniform algorithm to evaluate first-order queries. So now you don't need to design for each first-order property or for each property in that logic L a specific algorithm. You have one algorithm, I call it QE, not Queen Elizabeth, query evaluation. QE for query evaluation for the logic L. Now you give it input, the query, and the, and the graph, and it tells you yes or no. Of course, you may want to also get answer to give me all the notes, but let's just focus right now what, what, what Georg got Boolean queries, yes or no questions. So now you have a uniform algorithm. Turns out that now there is a, that this leads to a very intimate connection with complexity theory. So first of all, there is an important point to, to realize that the code chose first order logic because, well, that's the lingua franca in, math in mathematical logic, okay? So he chose first order logic. But many graph important, very simple graph theoretic properties cannot be expressed in first order logic. In, in 73, Fagin showed that first order, that, that connectivity, graph connectivity, S connected to T, cannot be expressed, reachability actually, not reachability. Is there a path from S to T? That cannot be expressed in first order logic. And in fact, for many, for many uh, graph theoretic properties, we need second order logic. Think of, for example, let's say reachability is an obvious one. You want to say the graph is, I'm sorry, colorability. You want to say graph is colorable. You have to say there exist color classes, red, green, and blue, and there are some properties, non -chroma chromatic edge, that you can specify in first order logic. So, uh, so existential second order emerges as a, as a natural language to express queries. But it turns out that existential second order correspond to, it can express precisely all the queries in NP. So every existential second order query is in NP, and every NP query is in existential second order. So we have this equivalence of two very, very different ways of defining complexity class. One is using a logic. One is using our standard definition. And the reason this is kind of amazing because existential second order, there's no computation, there's no polynomial, there's no time, and yet you get such an equivalence. And it gave rise to an area that called the theory of complexity theory, that the idea is that you can measure the complexity of property, but how much syntactical resources are needed to describe the property. Some intuitively, if you have a, a, a a short formula with few quantifiers, with, with not, not too many alternations between quantifiers, it is simpler than something that requires more syntactical resources. And for example, one thing that follows up from, from Fagin theorem is that full second order logic 
correspond precisely to the polynomial hierarchy. And this, this, the, the computational and the descriptive way of looking complexity theory is a beautiful area, and Neil Emmerman is, has written a, a, a beautiful book about this connect, connection between descriptive and computational complexity theory. Now let's go back to this uh, uh, core evaluation meta-algorithm. So in 1982, I, was a, a, I published a paper. I, was just, I just was arrived at Stanford in, in September 81. And I asked myself, what is the co computational complexity of this meta-algorithm? If you have an algorithm, you study its, com its computational complexity. What is the, its, its complexity? So first, you have to decide which logic you're going to study. As we saw, it will make a difference uh, looking at which logic to study. First of logic, essential second order. But that's, you decide, there is a, always a context. But the more uh, uh, subtle part was there are two inputs here. One input is the query, and one input is the, is the, the database. If you look at Fagin's theorem, he said for each fixed existential second order se, uh, query, it is an NP. So each one, it is fixed. It's a parameter. But you're not looking at what is the complexity in the query. So he didn't look at variable. Var, variable uh, uh, it, it, the query is a variable. So let's, the first question, which logic to choose? We have first order logic in session second order. But as we pointed out, first order logic cannot express uh, graph reachability. This was rediscovered in 79 by Eho and Ullman, and so we need induction. And they argued this is a very important property in many, many cases. You need to reason about graph, graph reachability. And in fact, in a, in a year later, Chan and Arel proposed a logic. They call it FP, fixed point logic, which is first order logic with induction added. And it's a logic that sits nicely between first order logic and essential second order. So we are going to look at all three logics. The second question is really a bit, a bit, a bit subtler. So complexity theory is all about scaling. How does performance scale as the size of the problem increase? But now imagine you're looking at a database. Let's suppose its size is, is, a, is a gigabyte. And you're giving a query about that size. So you call almost say, you can ignore the size of the query. Why? Because you have 10 to the 9 and a query of size 100. So what is the 100? But imagine what happens if we double the size of the query. It seems that the total lesson of the input, it makes practically no difference. But we all understand that query twice as big would be much more difficult to evaluate. So we need to understand that there are two input variables here and they play a very different role. And this is the beginning of what is today called multivariate complexity theory, where there are more than one input variable, and you analyze the role of them. And that later also emerges parameterized complexity theory. That's, uh, but today, people realize it's really about multi multivariate complexity theory. And, and these two variables play a very, very different role. So it does make sense to say, OK, just look at the total length of the input. You have to account for them separately. Um, so how do we account for them separately? Well, there are a simple way to do it. If you want to, to influence on the query, we'll fix the data and we'll vary the queries. If we want to see the influence of the data, we'll fix the query and vary the data. And you can think of them as there are, uh, there are scenarios that correspond to this. So the, the, the census happen every 10 years. So data now, the data now is fixed for 10 years. But demographers are, are spending a decade asking queries against a fixed, set, a fixed data set. On the other hand, if you're sitting on Wall Street, you may have, you're doing arbit price arbitrage, you may have one query, and you evaluate it every second, you run the query again. So the query is fixed, the data changes. So the, the proposal I made in 82 was considered what I call a tale of three complexities. One, we call expression complexity. Here we fix the data, and we vary the expression denoting the query. And why expression and not query complexity? Because the syntax is important here. You can express the same query in different syntaxes and it will make a difference. The syntax is important. So this is expression complexity. You fix the query and you vary the data. That's data complexity. Or you may have both. And that's called combined complexity. 
And the interesting uh, discovery was that if you look at expression and data complexity, there's exponential gap between them. So if you look, for example, at first order logic, data complexity log space, that's a fairly trivial result because you have fixed number of variables, you have to enumerate all of them, you can do it in logarithmic space. But expression complexity is space space complete, it's not too hard to encode QBF. You look at existential second order, data complexity due to Fagin is N NP, NP complete, but expression complexity, I'm sorry, yeah, this is the last line, go to the last line, NP complete. The expression complexity turn out is exponentially higher, next time complete. And fixed point logic sits in the middle, it's, you, you iterate uh, first order logic, so it's in polynomial time, polynomial time complete, but expression, complex, expression complexity is x time complete. And what, what does this tell us? It tells us that the theory, in fact, justifies our intuition. The query is much more, has much more impact, and data is just big and flat. Kind of the query is a structure and, 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 and a subtlety. And that's why it's so important to optimize queries. We don't optimize the data. Well, we build, we build indexes, okay? But we don't optimize the data. We optimize the query. And this distinction turned out to have broad application in, you, you look at knowledge representation, you run into the same issue, which is the, the, the queries and the data, and they play a different role. And I said this, this gave rise to a whole rich theory of multivariate complexity theory or parameterized complexity theory, and I will not go further into that. Now let's look again at just fixed point logic and existential second order. So we saw these two rows, data complexity P time, query complexity, uh, uh, I'm sorry, expression complexity, which should be x time, data complexity, np time, expression complexity, next time. Now, Fagin theory told us that if you focus on data complexity, sense second order is precisely np. So the natural question to ask is, okay, what happened with fixed point logic? Is it precisely polynomial time? And in 82, Immerman and myself show independently that if you have order built in, if you have ordered graph, then yes, it's polynomial time. Why do you need order? Because in Turing machine, everything is laid down nicely on a tape, so there is a natural order. What happens if you don't have order? Well, it's an open question. It's been open now for, for over 40 years. We do not know, can you characterize this orderless polynomial time? Can you characterize it? This is still very, very much an open question. Now I want to uh, jump to consent satisfaction was mentioned by Subach and by Georg. But I will look at it again from, from, from this point of view of what we have just seen for, for queries for logical algorithmics. So the classical, classical CSP is you have a set of variables and a set of values. And the idea is you're looking for assignments of, of values to variables. But you have constraints. A constraint is a pair of a tuple of variables and a relation of the same arity, a relation a set of tuples of values. And the idea is that you're looking for assignment, and the assignment has to be that when you apply the assignment to each tuple, it must be in the relation. And so this is called local consistency. When you look at each constraint, it has to be satisfied as the value assignment to values. Think of a, of a, a three clause, you have a clause, there are seven satisfying assignments. You can think of it this way. Instead of writing the formula, you can give seven satisfying assignments. We're asking, is there global consistency? Is a globally consistent assignment? This is a problem. This is a rich problem. It's a branch of AI. There is an annual conference, CS, CP. It's a, it's a rich area. And it shows up in many, many, many places. Okay? Not much. You don't see much of it in the theory community, as, it is, as I describe it but you go to, to many other areas and you find them, especially in AI. Now, as Georg mentioned, there is a closely related problem, which is the homomorphism problem. The homomorphism problem, you're given two relational structure. Remember, a structure is a domain. Relational means just a set of relations. And you're looking for homomorphism, which is a mapping from one domain to the second, domain from a mapping from A to B, such that every tuple in a relation in the, in the first structure is mapped to a tuple in the corresponding relation in the other structure. Okay? And the question is, is there such a homomorphism? The example, the classical example is you're given an undirected graph. That's your source. We call the left, the start A is the source, and B is the, is the target. 
And the target is going to be here K3, the three click. When you look at it, you realize that every such mapping from a graph or morphing from a graph to the three click, it means that every edge has to map to an edge in the three click, and that's exactly three colorability. So three colorability is a very, a very special case of homomorphism. And in fact, many, many, many problems can be described as homomorphism. Um, you know, K click is mapping of the of the of the of the of the K, K complete graph into the U graph. Hamiltonian cycle, you try to map a cycle of a certain length. Subgraphism, even ST connectivity can be described this way. And in 1993, Thomas Feder and I declare CSP to be the same homomorphism. And what do we mean by the same? What do we mean by declare? There are reductions, but reductions are so are really trivial reduction. It just viewed as syntactical reformatting. You go easily from one to the other. We said they should be considered the same problem. The nice thing about homomorphism is that's a, that's a problem that the theorem community has studied and is very familiar with. I mean, for example, if you go to, to Gary and Johnson, which was the Bible for complexity theory for in the, in the 80s, you find homomorphism there but CSP is not there. So the, the, what's called uniform CSP is you're given a pair of structure, you're asking, is there homomorphism from A to B? And that actually, the problem was shown already, and Leonid Levy already proved that this is the state of the problem, say it's NP complete. The reduction, again, once you have colorability, it's trivial, you get, you get it immediately. Notice that, again, we can think of it as a, as a multivariate problem because it has these two different variables the source and the target. And I'm going to consider the source as a query and the target as data. So now the target you're asking, is there, can you find A inside B? So A is the query, B is the data. So what we call the uniform problem corresponds to combined complexity. We're looking at both parts of the input. Both problems are, you count the lens as both. But we can also look at the, at we have expression complexity and data complexity. So let's look at non, a non what we call non-uniform CSP. So one way is to fix the query and vary the data. You have fixed source and you change the target. And again, because there are bounded, bounded number of elements that you're trying to assign, you can just try all assignment. So you can do it in log space. It's very easy to see you can do it in log space. What happens, however, if you fix the data you fix the target and you vary the query. Then it depends on your data. The simplest example, take your B to be K2. This is a two-colorability. Two-colorability is in P time. But make it K3, three-colorability, it's NP complete. So now it's very clear that it depends the complexity of non-uniform C-speed. When I look at, at the data complexity, will vary depending on the target. So this gave rise to a whole research program to try to, there is a whole terrain of problem. You can vary all the, what's the possible target. Each target defines a different problem. What is the computational complexity of these problems? So it's a large part of NP. Can we try to understand it? The, the dichotomy conjecture that, that, that Subash mentioned was made in 1993. And the conjecture was that depending on B, it's either going to be in P time or NP complete, and there's nothing in the middle. So, so a Ladner theorem does not exist in this domain. And the answer is because the syntax here, the intuition was that the syntax of, it's in NP, but the syntax is very limited. And therefore, the diagonalization that uh, Ladner had to do to create in-between problem, we don't seem to be able to do here. Now, again, Subas mentioned the, the algebraic approach, so let me very quickly introduce it. If you take, if you have two graphs, there is a basic operation of taking the product of these two graphs. What is the product? You're looking at pair of nodes. You take now, instead of the domain is now pair of nodes, pairs of nodes. There is an edge between two pairs if the two corresponding edges exist in the underlying graph. So this is something hopefully everybody is familiar with. You can generalize it easily. I won't write the formal definition to arbitrary structures. Again, you take, you take K tuples as the, as the element and the relation have to exist between them, so this is this is can be done. So now we get to the concept of polymorphism. So uh, what is a polymorphism? You can take you have a structure B, as I say, you can take product of structures. You can take it to the power of B to the K, 
for some k. And polymorphism are homomorphism from b to the k to b. It's super described it nicely as mixing solutions, but the simpler to think it's homomorphism from the product to itself. And in 93, Thomas and I proposed to study polymorphisms. And why is that? Because we discovered that under some condition, information about polymorphism tells you something about the complexity. What we made the following observation. Let's define a function to be near unanimity, a carrier function near unanimity. If k minus one of the inputs are the same value a, then you ignore the one outlier and the answer is a. Okay? So if k minus one people vote for a, you ignore the one person who is a minority and you say, we go with a. So if you're looking at a, a, a k equal three, majority is a, is a near unanimity operation. And we're able to prove that if the polymorphism of B contain a near unanimity function, then C of P of B is in polynomial time. So information about the, the polymorphism tell you something about the complexity. And we say, well, we have to, somebody has to study this. This is an important thing. And this call to study polymorphism was taken on by Peter Givons in Oxford and, and, and his uh, collaborators and students. And he, made, he discovered something we did not know, which was that polymorphism are a major subject of study in universal algebra. Universal algebra is a branch of a model theory that looks at functional structure. Structure not with relation, but only with functions. Groups, groupoids, all this stuff. And this was popular, you know, if you look at all of mathematics, and I would say concrete mathematics is somewhere in the corner. If you take all of concrete mathematics, you find logic somewhere in the corner. And if you take logic, all of logic, you find universal algebra somewhere in the corner. It was popular in the Soviet Union. So Peter, Peter Givon started bringing, bringing people to the Soviet Union, Bulatov, Zhu, Kochin, and, and others. And they first proved the following beautiful observation that Thomas and I just had a vague intuition, but they actually proved it. If you have two structures, B1 and B2, if they have the same sort of polymorphisms, then CS, the two CSP problems are polynomially equivalent. So studying polymorphism really is the way to understand the complexity of CSB, CSP of B. And that led to research programs of almost 25 years. And finally, in 2017, by following this algebraic approach, uh, Pulatov and Zhuk were able independently to prove the conjecture. Okay? And as somebody asked, in fact, it's an effective conjecture. Given a structure, you can decide whether it's its CSP problem is in polynomial time or it is in a, a NP, or is NP complete. Now, let's go back, however, to the, to the query, comple query complexity or the expression complexity. So we saw if you have one source and you vary, I'm sorry, data complexity, you have one source and you vary the data, data complexity, it's in log space. But what if it's not a single structure or a class of structure? We want to identify classes of targets for which the problem is going to be tractable. And the, the condition we, we are able to identify, this is later work with Victor Dalman for Ken Kolaitis, was, and again, it connects with what we heard from, from Georg. We look at the, at the underlying graphs, not the, not the hypergraphs, but the graphs. So the graph is that uh, two elements are connected if they appear in the same tuple. And you look at the, at the underlying graph, and you look at the core of this graph. The core is the unique uh, homomorph homomorphic uh, su structure, which is identical up to isomorphism, because if you have its minimal unique, it's minimal, so two of them must be isomorphic to each other. So C sub K is a, are the class of structure whose three widths, whose core is three widths of at most K. And we showed on one hand, that CSP of CK, so you, all your sources now have core with bounded three widths. This is tractable. And assuming uh, that F, FPT different than W1, it's an assumption in, in a parameter complexity, this is required as long as your classes are defined by graphs. So there's no contradiction from what we heard from Georg. As long as you find 
classes of, 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 of structure by the underlying graph, then this is the, the, the necessary and sufficient condition. Now let's go back a little bit to think about the query. And, and so we know in general evaluating, evaluating relational query can be difficult. And, and for example, evaluating relational join is known to be a difficult problem. That's really what, what uh, Georg was telling us about. Why is it, why is it difficult to evaluate relational, relational joins? So the intuition actually, I, was, I, was, I probably had the intuition for this when I was in fourth grade. Because an eighth grader came to me and I said, I hear you're good in math. And I said, yeah, I'm doing, I'm doing OK. He said, OK, I'll give you a, a little exercise. Compute this. And he wrote it down. And I dutifully went, started from the left, and process, process, process to the right. And only when I go to the right, I realize I've been had. OK? So this is what happens when you evaluate a big join. It could be that the, the big join is empty, but the intermediate result can be very, very large. So can we bound intermediate results? If the whole thing is large, there's nothing I can do. But can I at least bound intermediate result if they're not necessarily to be large? And this, again, let's look at this from a logical point of view. So let's look at these two, two joints, OK? So you, you, I'm asking for a join of relation, two relations, R1 and R2. Let's say they're both three R relations. And I want the third argument of the first relation to be equal to the, the third argument to be equal to the first argument of the second relation. So I'm joining on the last one, like RxyZ and RzYW. They have to agree on the, on the last and third one. But then I'm going to project only on the first, on the first, the first and last coordinate of the 6R relation. So I'll, if I do it naively, I'll end up with a 6R relation. It can be quite large. But actually, I realize that the, the second argument of this relation doesn't matter. I should project it away early on and only work with the binary relations because it will never show up. So this idea that you can do, look at your projection and apply them eagerly is called early projection. And it reduces the arity of the relations. It turns out that this early projection both bound the width of intermediate relation, but logically it's equivalent to variable reuse. So what do I mean by variable reuse? So we can define a logic LK. So usually when you learn logic, you say you have the set of vars, x1, x2, x3, dot, dot, dot. You have infinite supply of variables. But we need to have sustainable logic. In sustainable logic, we should not be able to print as many variables as you want. We should be able to do it sustainably. So L sub k is a sustainable logic. You get a budget of k variables, x1 to xk, and this is it. You cannot print more variables. Okay? So how do you manage? Well, you have to be, you have to be a, bit, a bit more careful. So you, you can take the assertion there exists a path of lens 2, and you say, okay, there exists x, y, and z, a path from x to y and a path from y to z. Or you can say there is x and y and an edge from x to y, and now I don't need to know what was x. So I re-quantify over x, and I say there is an x such that now there is an edge from y to x. Because I quantify again, it's not the original x. So now I've done it more economically, so to speak. Turn out that having a bounded bound on the number of variables puts a bound on the side of intermediate relation. So if you look at uh, expression complexity, so remember F of FP and ESO had data complexity of log space P time and NP, and expression complexity of P space X time and X time. But if you bound, if you look at variable confined queries, the, the expression complexity goes down. Uh, would be nice if it, if it would have gone down to, to log space for FO, but it doesn't go down to P time, but it goes down. The exponential gap either disappears or narrows down significantly. And this, the effect is that one way for us, in fact, to optimize, optimize query is to try to rewrite them. So effectively, we are using a smaller number of variables. So now this gives us the following optimization problem. Given a, a formula in first order logic, what is the minimal number of variables you can write it with? Unfortunately, everything about first order logic typically is undecidable. This is an undecidable, this is an undecidable problem. 
So let's look at not full first order logic. Let's look at a class of, of queries that Georg has mentioned. It's our conjunctive queries. So essentially, conjunctive queries are a formula you can write using no disjunction, no negation, no universal quantifier. Only existential quantifier and conjunction. Okay? For example, if you want to write the query uh, grandparent, what is grandparent xy? There exists some z. Here, it, the quantifier is, is implicit. If there is a parent from x to z and a parent from z to y, then you know that uh, x is a grandparent of, uh, of, uh, of y. And it turned out that in practice, many common SQL queries are called select project join are essentially conjunctive, conjunctive queries. And again, conjunctive queries, when you look at them, you realize it's essentially the same as CSP. Because you can look at, the, at your conjunction by itself as a structure that you try to map homomorphically to the data. So, so CSP, conjunctive queries, and homomorphism, they're all the same problem. Now, Chandra and Merlin observed that the expression complexity of conjunctive queries is NP-complete. Again, three colorability. It goes back to simple observation. Now, more precisely, if you look at, okay, when you evaluate conjunctive query, what happens? You see that you'll, it will be the size of the data, and in the exponent, you'll have the size of the query. And, and, and Mihaly pointed out that this is not fixed parameter tractable. That would be much nicer if we could, we could have something would be maybe exponential in the query, but it would be polynomial in the, in, the, in the data. So maybe something like C to the Q and B to the D. That would be fixed parameter tractable. But then in the paper that, uh, that Georg mentioned from 97, Padmini Nakaki showed that quantum evaluation is W1 complete, so it's not very unlikely to be fixed parameter tractable. But let's go back to the idea of fixing the number of variables. So let's look at conjunctive query sub k, which conjunctive queries, where if you reuse variables, you can write them using k variables. Okay? Turns out, if you can rewrite the query using, using a, a k variable for a fixed k, then the complexity is the size of the query times b to the k. So k is the critical parameter. So you get, for a fixed k, it is fixed parameter tractable. Now, of course, for a fixed query, it's fixed parameter tractable, but not very interesting. But now you have a class of query, the, the, the parameter is the tree width, and now it's fixed parameter tractable. So the critical parameter is the number of variables. So can we characterize, given a conjunctive query, how many variables does it need? Full first or logic and decidable, how about conjunctive queries? And there come, again, the concept of tree widths. So, so I won't define tree widths, Gary mentioned it, but I like the way uh, uh, Neshatril uh, defined it. You take the graph and you massage it, and you create, instead of having nodes, you create, we call them potatoes, and you get a tree structure, but the potatoes, potatoes are a bit fat, so the tree width is the size of the, of, the size of the, of the potatoes. There is this minus one because uh, uh, Robertson and Seymour wanted trees to have tree width one. Uh, somehow they thought it would be more natural. So there is very annoying number minus one. So if we have a conjunctive query, we can look at the query graph. So again, I'm skipping the hypergraph. I'm saying the, the variables are the nodes, and edges exist when two variables are in the same atom. And so the tree width is of the query is the tree width of, the, of, the, of, the, of that graph. And uh, Colitis and I showed in 1998 that the query can be rewritten, and there is a formal definition. What does it mean to write a query? But it can be written in using k variable precisely if that, the tree width of the graph is at most k. So there is a, to me, this is a beautiful connection between number of variables, which is a very logical concept, and tree width, which is a very graph theoretic concept. Now, one question is, okay, can we use it to optimize conjunctive queries? Well, not easily, because determining the tree width of a graph is NP-hard. I mean, for a fixed K, you can test in, in linear time, I, 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 I recall, but finding the tree width is NP-hard. And, and this is not a theoretical problem. In, in practice, there are very many situations where you have to evaluate large joints, and 
it's a, it's a problem because the way databases, typical databases work, the way they, they find the best way to do it, they have a way to cost, it's called cost-based optimization. They look at different orders of the joints and they assign a cost and then you have to search for optimal plan, query plan. The larger the join, the more possible query plans and the search problem became as difficult, if not more difficult, than actually evaluating the query. So if you look, if you give databases large joins, they do not do well. So almost 20 years ago, with the graduate students at Rice, we said, well, let's, we don't know how to build a, a we don't compute three decompositions, but we have a way of trying to approximate it, not in a formal sense, but in a heuristic sense, using the, the correspondence with CSP. Let's take CSP heuristics and apply them to try to get a good uh, tree decomposition. Best effort, okay? So we use, effectively, again, we try to, to create smaller tree widths and, uh, and minimize the number of variables. And we compared ourselves to, uh, uh, I think at the time was Postgres, for example. Look at the Postgres. Uh, thing. And there are different plots here, but uh, the point is that uh, the, 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 the line on the left, this is, this is logarithmic scale, so the line on the left will be just try to give it to Postgres as is and let evaluate it. And then the purple line is after using all the CSP heuristics. And, and you see that the slope is different. And slope is different. Logarithmic scale means that we get exponential advantage. So it does, it does actually work in practice. Now, it is true that computing through the composition is, uh, is NP-hard. But it turns out that since 2004, which is when I did this work almost 20 years ago, people are now building 3D composition solvers in the annual competition, and the solvers are getting better and better every year. I'd like to bring the student back, but he's now uh, his own company, so he's not coming back. And so we have not pursued the work of, of to try to take 3D composition in, uh, in this context to optimize conjunctive queries. But uh, we have looked at a, a Boolean reasoning where you have very similar problem. For example, you want to do, uh, I think, uh, you mentioned model counting. We want to do model counting and, and things like that. And turn out that uh, using these three, three decomposition solvers is actually a very good tool we, to, construct, uh, uh, to construct three decomposition, in fact, join trees, and do mo model counting. So I'll conclude here. I try to give you a logical perspective on algorithm and complexity. I try to show how the chief complexity theory comes out of this perspective. Multivariate complexity comes out of this perspective. Dichotomy theorem comes out of this out of this perspective. And I think even this is still ongoing research, but I think even practical approaches to to, to reasoning are able to use this perspective. Perfect timing. Maybe a, a remark. So you gave this nice definition of k variable queries uh, related to trivies. Uh, acyclic queries also have a nice logic characterization. Which one? Acyclic queries. Yeah, yeah. Namely, guarded existential. Right, right. Guarded formulas. Yeah. This guarded fragment is a very well known fragment right, of the first order right. logic. Yeah. They exactly correspond to yes, yes. existential and, and conjunctive yeah. queries. The, the question to you is what about? About hypertree, bounded hypertree width, does it have any kind of logical so analog? K guarded, basically. Hmm? K guarded. K guarded, yeah, K guarded, yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs>